Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Green Ribbon Science Panel meeting. My name is Asha Seti, and I'm a public participation specialist for the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'll be facilitating the public comment portion of this meeting and encourage you to provide us with feedback. Today's Green Ribbon Science Panel meeting is subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, which preserves the public transparency of the panel's discussion and decision. You've all entered in viewer mode with cameras and mics turned off. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our website. If you're interested in providing a public comment, you'll have the opportunity to do so around 9.30. There's three ways you can participate. You can click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen when it comes time, and then we'll call on you based on the order of the raised hand and unmute you at that time. If you prefer your comment to be read out loud, you can type it into the chat. And the last option is to email us at saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov. With this online format, let's go over what to do if the meeting cuts out. If you think it cut out on your end, just go ahead and try to rejoin the meeting. If that doesn't work and it's a problem on our end, just bear with us for about five minutes in case we need to restart the meeting. If neither of those options work, Give us about 15 minutes to set up a new meeting link and check the Green Ribbon Science Panel webpage for the update. Um, that's it for opening announcements. And I'd like to hand it over to our director, Dr. Meredith Williams. Thank you, Asha, and welcome panelists. It's good to see you. It's been a while. And I always, as you well know, I very much enjoy these meetings. Um, and it's interesting for me because I'm no longer involved in the day-to-day -day of safer consumer products. And what I've noticed is um, there's both a lot of change within the program and there's a great deal of stability. Um, and so uh, when you don't see what happens every day, sometimes you get a briefing on a particular issue and you see a step change in terms of how the, the program is attached attacking things and how sophisticated the work has become. And that's very exciting. At the same time, um, some things uh, are stable. We recently welcomed back one of our staff members who had um, left, the, left the department for a while, but um, is now back with us, Ash Virasamy. And it just reminded me that there's both, again, this change and the stability. And one of the things that has been stable is uh, that we established three pillars of the program. And those do continue to guide the work and the program still keeps an eye on building capacity, on executing the as they implement the regulations and on setting a direction for safer chemistry and commerce, safer chemistry and commerce. And so those tenets still show up day in and day out. And uh, I think they really, they do well for the program. The program does well by referring to those and using those as guideposts. And today you'll see just how much capacity building has gone on in the program and how wonderful the staff is. And as great as the expertise is in, and the range of skills there are within the program, we simply need more staff. There's no getting around it. And uh, we are hopeful that we have the opportunity to get more staff. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the department as a whole. The administration put forth a proposal in this year's budget to revise a fee structure that hasn't been revised since 1998. And the fees that support the work of the department, not even, not all of those fees even have cost of living increases in them. So you can imagine how much, um, how much the value of those fees has eroded over the years. And in fact, uh, we did an estimate of how much more the, the legislature expects us to do. And there's something like 90 different statutory authorities that have been put in place since those fees were established. And yet we still have the same number of staff that we've had for, for almost 20 years. And so it's really urgent to get these fees um, revised so that we can really realize the vision of, of the program of safer consumer products in green chemistry, but of the department as a whole in terms of protecting vulnerable communities, um, really playing a part in remediating contaminated sites around the state to make, make room for more housing, 
um, you know, make land available for housing and smart growth and um, all the different things that the department is responsible for. So the other thing that the proposal would do would be to establish a board, uh, a five member board. And, um, and that would be one of the primary responsibilities of the, that board would be to review appeals for hazardous waste permits. And also it would be an opportunity, another opportunity for the public to engage with what's the strategy of the department? Where is, its he where it's, where is it headed? What do we want to do in California to provide leadership around hazardous waste generation and, um, and different chemical, you know, advanced chemicals regulation? So we have a lot riding on the proposal. It's going through the budget process, the hearing process, but I wanted to make you all aware of it because what we know about safer consumer products is that um, without more resources, we're going to have to start, you know, um, shuffling people around. We will have to take people off of the work of choosing products and move them on to evaluating the alternatives analyses we receive and um, developing regulatory responses. And we don't want to do that. We think the work that the work is, I think you all know how good the work is, and, and it's important to continue to identify those product chemical combinations that really warrant a search for a safer alternative. Um, so of course, if we get those resources, who knows, you know, watch out world in terms of safer consumer products. But even with those resources, we know that we need to continue to partner, not just um, with our other state agencies, but with our other state agencies, with other state agencies, Washington and Oregon come to mind first and foremost in terms of all the work we've done with them under the Green Chemistry MOU. And we're excited to begin to engage the new administration at the federal level to see what we can do and how we can partner with them for information sharing and um, revisit the the green chemistry MOU that was so fruitful um, as the program first got started. So I wanted to just touch on a few things that are going on at, the, at that higher level and um, put some of the, the program work in context for the discussion today. And at any point, if there are questions about the reform effort, I'm happy to answer them, but really happy to be here. Thank you again for taking so much time and. Um, advising the work and participating in this panel. It's tremendous that you, you know, your commitment to this program. Thank you. Asha? Oh, actually, I think uh, is our take over from here. I think. Yeah, I take over yeah. from here. Okay. And so I get the privilege of thanking you, Meredith, now as the director of the department for your work to protect all of California and importantly, for your work to support uh, this program at this higher level. And so there's things you can do in this position, as you mentioned, that you couldn't do before. So it's a, it's a thrill and a pleasure to see you in this role and taking your skills to that next level. Um, and it's a thrill turning to today's business uh, to be here with the panel. So I'm gonna do just a quick um, set of logistics that probably everyone's familiar with now because we've been zo doing Zoom for quite a long time. Um, then we'll do a roll call um, and I'll review today's agenda and Art's going to chair the first part of the meeting. So, and I'll be coming back for more. So uh, first, um, just on logistics, uh, everyone is already doing this, but it's helpful if you could please keep yourself muted when you're not speaking, um, even at the risk of having all of us say, time to unmute yourself <laughs> when you do, um, because it helps uh, with background noise issues. Um, we, since we aren't in person, we don't have our handy speaker cards and, and the easy ability to wave at each other, although keeping your camera on is very helpful in that regard, if you don't mind. Obviously, turn it off if you need to blow your nose or something, but um, just being part of the discussion, it's really helpful to have the camera on. Um, but uh, for um, managing the discussion, we're going to use the raise hand function, and so I want to make sure everyone can do that. Uh, for most uh, versions of Zoom, that's now at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, for some people, you have to click on the participants and then you get the hand raise function. So I'd appreciate it if all of the panel members could please um, raise their hands at this time. I just want to make sure that everyone can do that. And 
Is there anyone who couldn't raise their hand? I don't see Emma or Elaine yet. So it should either be at the bottom of the screen, raise hand, or it should be, um, if you click on participants, um, the option to raise the hand um, is, it might be at the bottom of the screen, Emma. So um, right, um, at the, if you go to, if you click on the, the Zoom screen in the same panel that has mute and stop video, it should have um, participants share screen. There we go. Okay. Um, any panelists who couldn't? Okay. All right, good. Then I think we're good on that. Uh, and so that raise hand will show in the order that you've raised your hands and we'll endeavor to keep to that order except for when we're having a content focused discussion in which case we might ask you to lower your hand if you're not on that topic and then come back when we come back to that later in the meeting. Um, at the, let's see, then when you're done talking, we'll appreciate it if you can remember to lower your hand and mute your mic again. That's the usual stuff and everybody's probably pretty good at that right now. Um, folks are doing a good job just using the chat function for technical issues uh, because this is a meeting under Bagley Keen. Uh, although the chat is being recorded, we do wanna keep the conversation oral so that everyone can hear what we're talking about. So um, we'll start uh, with a roll call of members, and I also will take the opportunity to first welcome everyone uh, to the meeting and thank the panelists for their service as their, with their individual expertise, which is totally amazing um, to the state of California. And I'd like to turn it over to Art for the next introduction, and then um, we can go in alphabetical order by first name. If you can figure out where you are on the list, uh, you, you yourself are always on top. But if you have the panelists, uh, the participant lists open, you'll see everyone else's name in alphabetical order. So it should be easy to figure out when you come up. So Art, let's start with you. And you might want to have a few words of welcome before we go to Anne. Um, thank you very much, Kelly. I'm Art Fall, Apple. And um, this is just really exciting. I'm, I'm just amazed at how much we got done last time doing it virtually, uh, the virtual meeting last time. So thank you very much to the panel members and um, uh, welcome. Am I next, Kelly? Is that Yeah, why don't, indicating? Why don't, please just go ahead and um, okay. so keep an eye on your name. And if, if we skip over you, just sleep on in, uh, we can do that. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Anne Blake, Environmental and Public Health Consulting, Alameda, California. Dennis Schusterman, um, retiree from uh, California Depar Department of Public Health, Occupational Health Branch, and also Emeritus Professor at UC San Francisco. You're muted, Elaine, but you're next. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out what list we're going off of. Um, Elaine cohn Hubble, um, US EPA Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment. The panelists list, if you bring that up, it's on the right and it's alphabetical by first name. So that was where I was going. Your name always shows up at the top. So you have to figure out where you fit in among everyone else. Yeah, I never know which part of my last name people use. <laughs> Well, that's why we're using the first name. So <laughs> Zoom oh, that. it was my first name. Sorry. Yeah, that's oh, why I'm you're gonna... so early and why <laughs> Emma's next. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Emma Lavoy, US EPA, Office of the Science Advisor, Program and Engagement. Helen Holder, Distinguished Technologist at HP. Jack, you're next. Sorry, I don't have the list in front of me. Jack Leinard, consultant of the personal care industry, retired from Unilever. Hi, uh, Julie Shannon, I'm a professor of material science and engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Hello, this is Ken Zarker, Washington State Department of Ecology. Hi, this is Melanie Marty, retired from Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment at Cal EPA. Hi, this is Mike Carangelo. I am with SC Johnson. I am currently the director of GMP Compliance. 
Um, hi, everyone. Molly Jacobs. Um, I'm a senior research associate at the University of Massachusetts Lowell in our Lowell Center for Sustainable Production. Hi, this is Rebecca Sutton. I'm a senior scientist with the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Oh, I'm Suzanne Brander. I'm an assistant professor and ecotoxicologist at Oregon State University. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Malloy. I'm at uh, I'm a professor in the School of Law at UCLA uh, with a joint appointment in the School of Public Health. Thank, thank you all. I, this is just a, an amazing, talented crowd from all over the country, and really appreciate your participation. So today's meeting will be brief and focused. So we're continuing to figure out how to use this online format. Um, and one of the lessons from today will be, you know, how much we can use this in the future when we start being able to travel again. It still may be good for us to gather from time to time electronically. Carl's going to kick off the meeting by highlighting a few successes from the program update, which I'm hoping everyone was every, able to see the world's most efficient update video <laughs> that he provided um, in advance of the meeting. And that's on YouTube for members of the public that um, haven't seen it yet. Uh, the panel will have the opportunity for clarifying questions for Carl after his presentation. Um, then we'll have the public comment period. So if you're a member of the public and wish to make a comment, that'll be your opportunity. Um, then we'll hear two presentations from Safer Consumer Products staff. Um, so one about the timeline, which is the first item on our agenda, and the second on the uh, fourth, the draft 2021-2023 uh, priority product work plan, which is the other topic on our agenda. And then we've got two discussion periods with the idea being that we have kind of a rapid fire initial uh, discussion for quick, uh, quick points um, and to identify those things where we'd like to make a deeper dive or um, so make broader comments ourselves or to have interaction with the other panelists because I think there are several areas where it's likely that interaction from the panel will build into a better set of input for the staff that'll be more useful for them. Helen's always telling me we need to do this more. So I'm gonna do our best to see to make that work online. So um, during those rapid fire initial comments, it would be very helpful if you identify anything that you think merits longer discussion. So with that, I'm going, oh, we'll have a 10 minute break at a fixed time. And that fixed time is, um, at 1040. So we've got it and we would really please appreciate holding that to 10 minutes. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Art to, to, and Carl for the next step in the meeting. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, at this point, Carl will highlight a few key successes and updates since the last meeting. And then we'll open it up for questions on the program update, um, Carl. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you, panel, for being here today and for your ongoing support. We really value and appreciate it. Um, I know you're all very busy. Um, hopefully, you had a chance to review the update that was sent out, and uh, I'm just going to do a few highlights. Um, and then um, Carl, this is Art. I'm sorry for inter interrupting, but you seem muffled. Um, it's not just me or I, I hear it too. Okay. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, yes, it is. Thank you very much, Carl. Great. Uh, I'll lean in. So um, just a few highlights. You know, we've been busy as we usually are. Um, as the update highlighted, we uh, continue to update the candidate chemical list and we identified six new chemicals to that list. Nothing jumped out at us on that, but we'll be looking at that further. Um, we also, um, in terms of the priority products in the queue, the next priority product to take effect will be carpets and rugs starting in July, if all goes well with the OAL review. And then we have three rulemaking packages in the queue for the next few months, uh, followed by some other ones that are in the work plan and the timeline. And I'm not gonna spend any time talking about the timeline and the work plan. Um, I did also wanna highlight that in terms of those products already in the alternatives analysis process, uh, methylene chlor chloride, um, paint strippers, um, the manufacturers all, rather than finish the AA process, notified us that they were leaving the market in California or moving to other alternatives. Um, we're 
following up on that, looking and see what, they, what they've moved to. We've had some reports of some people who maybe slipped through the process, so we're looking at that as well. The bottom line is though, um, is that those products are not being sold in California now, and so we're protected from methylene chloride exposures, which is a good thing. As far as the spray polyurethane foam systems with MBI, as you know, um, we have gone through the AA process. We approved their abridged AA, um, gave them the notice of compliance, and but now because of the lawsuit that ACC filed against us, we have that on hold until we can resolve some CEQA issues. Um, and I'm not going to go into that. If you have questions, I can, but um, that should be in the next 30 to 60 days, hopefully. Um, and then um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things out of the work plan that are, that are important is that we did approve the petition to list uh, zinc in automotive tires. So we're going to be moving through that process. And in the interim, out of the outstanding work done in the, the Northwest with our colleagues up there, um, we're going to be looking at uh, six PPD. Uh, in tires as well. Um, and we also um, let people know that we don't, um, are, we've decided not to pursue lead acid batteries uh, as a potential priority product, largely because of the immense amount of work being done um, in terms of researching uh, safer alternatives um, in many, many sectors. Um, so um, those are the highlights from the work plan and the AAs. Things I'm really excited about, um, I'm excited that, uh, you know, we uh, had the opportunity to publish in environmental health perspectives uh, a commentary article about how our approach to PFAS as a class. Uh, if you haven't read it, I, I sure hope you can. We were excited to see that out. I think it's very insightful about the core tenets of our program, uh, of what we're trying to do to be precautionary and to be efficient. And I'm also excited because the GRASP has continually urged us to put out information and publish things that we're doing uh, other than just cranking out um, the priority products. So um, we're very excited about that. Um, it's a great reflection of, of our outstanding staff as well. Also, I'm excited because we now uh, have a full complement of staff uh, in, in the technical positions. We hired uh, in the last two weeks, um, four new environmental scientists. Uh, Meredith mentioned one to come back to us. And we uh, filled our environmental toxicologist position, Lynn Nakayama Wong, who worked in our HERO program and with us up to, to till now has now entered the fold of SCP formally, and we're we're really excited about that as well. Um, and lastly, I, I do want to uh, highlight that I did put a little more detail in the presentation about what Meredith was talking about about the department's efforts looking at at fee reform, looking at governance, um, looking moving forward to meet our mandates and to provide the service that everyone expects us to provide. And so I gave some insights into what that element for the Safer Consumer Products Program did in, the, in our workload analysis, and that will continue. Uh, and so I, if you have more questions about that, happy to answer them. There's a lot more information out there. So I'll just leave it at that kind of high level and, and open it up to if, if anyone has any questions. Carl, thank you. Um, at this time, are there any clarifying questions for Carl? Um, yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, I just need a, a point of clarification. Well, first of all, I, I found the introductory slides very useful uh, um, and um, edifying, um, but I had a, cl a clarifying question about methylene chloride. Um, so you're saying that methylene chloride is not being sold for as a paint stripper in California. Mm -hmm. That's the, so if that's based on the um, the impact of the uh, US EPA um, a, um, action, it really only applies to consumers. It doesn't apply to the uh, commercial sector. So I just want I wanted to make that point. I mean, there's a, there's a, a substantial portion of the supply chain went through big, big box stores. So that was both for uh, consumers and for contractors. Uh, but my understanding is under the, um, the, the federal, uh, the EPA um, action under uh, rule six or whatever it is, um, they banned its uh, sale in, in consumer uses, but they actually dropped the proposal, the, the half of the proposal that had to do with commercial use. And that that actually was withdrawn. That was part of the uh, uh, January 20th uh, uh, 
2017 Obama era uh, EPA um, proposal, and it was, uh, I think, formally withdrawn during the, this past administration. So they have to start from scratch uh, on that. So I just wanted to, to make it clear that at least in the occupational health community, uh, we see the, um, the glass as both half full and half empty as, as pertains to methylene chloride. Well, Dennis, uh, thanks for raising that point. Um, it, it's important uh, to understand that our regulations apply to both the retail use of methylene chloride paint strippers and the commercial and industrial use. So even when EPA banned the, the retail sale, we were still focusing additionally on all uses of methylene chloride. And so the manufacturers were still subject to our regulations and we're still going through the process based on that. So, um, you know, it's complex in terms of TOSCA preemptions when they apply. But in this case, we were picking up, you said they dropped that, that portion, we continued to carry it. Uh, and so that's still in place in California. Um, you know, what EPA will end up doing um, down the road with the new administration, uh, we have great interest in Meredith's already talking to the leadership um, in, at Washington and uh, we will continue that as well as with other states like Ken and um, those folks in Oregon and other leading states that are also interested in TOSCA implementation. But it's an important point that we need to be in a space where uh, we focus on things that are meaningful and practical, not preempted um, and can get, this, get things done, so. Okay, thanks for the information. Yeah. Uh, Meredith, I see that you wanna jump in. Yeah, I just want to make sure. So <laughs> just to make sure we're absolutely clear about this, Dennis, if manufacturers want to sell to the commercial, you know, to commercial clients, they either they have to have given us a notice of withdrawal. So the notices of withdrawal of the product apply across all the sectors. There was no differentiation. So we do not think it's it's sold in California and we will be, you know, making sure that that's the case through enforcement and inspections and things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Elaine, I thought your hand was up. Do you have a question? Uh, no, thank you. I, I, I answered my own question. <laughs> Let me just okay. also comment, Art, um, as, as Meredith said, we, we plan on following up, but this is a, a, a highlights the resource issue for us. We've never been resourced to have a full complement to do compliance and enforcement. We think it's very important um, that when we implement regulations, we can make sure that their people comply with them and that we can enforce them. So that's part of this, the importance of looking at our, our fee reform uh, initiatives so that we can make sure that we have the resources we need to do the job from A to Z. Um, Carl, thank you. Are there any more clarifying questions? I'm not seeing any hands. So, well, thank you very much, Carl, uh, for the program update. Before we uh, begin today's panel presentation and discussion, we'll take public comments at, at this time. Um, Asha? Great, thank you, Art. We'd like to ask that your comments are directed only to the Green Ribbon Science panel and that they're focused on the agenda topics. Um, as this is a working meeting, the panel will be accepting comments but will not be responding to questions. Just a reminder, you have three ways to comment. You can click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen and we'll unmute you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, you can type it into the chat box or you can send us an email at saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov and we'll read it out loud. Uh, we'll give uh, people a couple minutes to raise their hand or send us a comment. Okay, well, um, I'm not seeing any chats and I'm not seeing anything in our email. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and close out the public comment period today. Um, please feel free to email us if you have any thoughts during the course of the panel meeting, but otherwise, um, we'll go ahead and close out the comment period and I'll pass back to the panel. Asha, thank okay. you very much. Um, at this time, SCP Senior Environmental Scientist Topher Buck will present to us the underlying design and intended purpose of the SCP's newly published public uh, timeline. Topher will highlight some of the timeline features and how 
SCP plans to use and develop this new asset over time. Topher? Thank you, Art. Um, let me just check, make sure that everybody can hear me okay before I continue. Um, you sound fine, thank you very much. Great, thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Art said, I'm Topher Buck. I'm a senior environmental scientist in the Safer Consumer Products Program. Uh, as many of you know, I'm relatively new to DTSC and to SCP. I've been here now approximately nine months. Um, and I'll, I'll just take a moment to say that I have known, I've been fortunate to know most of you for many years. Um, there are a few of you I, I haven't gotten to know yet, um, but it's it's lovely to see you all, even if even if it's only on video. So thank you for, for joining us today. And uh, so I'm here to, as Art said, to, to talk about the new resource that we've recently deployed on the Safer Consumer Products website, the, the timeline. Uh, so next slide, please, Chris. Okay, so a brief outline uh, in the next nine minutes or so, I'm gonna talk briefly about, you know, why we created the timeline, uh, what it is and is not, how we created it, uh, how we expect it to change in the future. And then I'll talk briefly at the end of, uh, mention a few challenges that we've identified to date. Next slide. So why create a, a timeline? Well, essentially a three-part answer. The first of which is that as all of you know quite well during the November, 2019 Green Ribbon Science Panel meeting, you, the panel asked us to make our work more transparent uh, and to provide clear signals to our stakeholders uh, where, or I should really say on what uh, we intend to focus. Um, and to reference an expression used several times during that meeting, we effectively hope that the timeline will serve uh, as a crystal ball. Second, uh, we've received similar feedback from um, many other stakeholders, uh, you know, business community, NGOs and the like. Um, and third, and I would say certainly you know, last, but certainly not least, uh, you know, the, the timeline really makes manifest DTSC's overarching commitment to transparency and accountability. Next slide. So what is the timeline? Uh, well, the first part of this answer in, in some ways really is more where. Uh, so uh, the timeline, as I've already indicated, is available on the SCP homepage. Uh, next slide, Chris. And this is just a, a quick screenshot to show you the introductory or explanatory text that appears on the homepage, as well as the link to the timeline itself. Um, uh, you know, in a nutshell, this text describes the timeline's purpose, scope, format, and limitations. And I'll just say a few words briefly about that. Um, I mean, I, hopefully the purpose is, is relatively self-explanatory given the text here, and I'm not gonna take the time to read it to you, of course. Um, in terms of scope, I would say that it, this, this really addresses both the temporal and programmatic scope. So temporal meaning essentially that it, it explains that the timeline um, displays or covers 15 months of activity uh, and programmatically essentially that it explains that the timeline is not intended to be a comprehensive view of all the work that SCP does. Uh, in terms of format, um, I particularly call your attention to the fact that it, it talks about uh, this, this text that is talks about the fact that single day events are typically shown as diamonds or milestones um, but may be shown as bars to indicate ranges of likely dates, right? Which is in, this, in a sense a way for us to indicate uh, in some cases that there's a bit of uncertainty uh, associated with precise dates, especially uh, farther in the future. And then finally, limitations or caveats uh, really is you know, an indication that this information is updated periodically. And so it may be out of date um, at least up to a degree, and, and that, you know, this is not intended, the timeline is not intended to serve as a definitive uh, repository of regulatory dead, deadlines or dates, uh, and that users should consult CalSAFER for that information. Uh, and then finally, of course, it, it also provides a contact information for feedback on the timeline, which is something we really hope to get. Next slide. Um, okay, so next, in terms of what is the timeline, right? I, I hopefully, or 
this may already be clear to you, but fundamentally, uh, the timeline is a visual representation of the program's current and ongoing project work. Um, and we chose to represent this in a Gantt chart. Uh, and you may not be able to tell on the video, but I, I'm looking at you, Tim. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, you know, be happy to describe in greater detail during the discussion period, why we chose a Gantt chart. And, and I would say certainly that the format is one of the attributes of the timeline on that we particularly appreciate you know, the panel's feedback on. Um, it's also, or, you know, so as a Gantt chart, it's basically organized by product category and project. Um, and so let, let's take a look at that. Next slide. Um, so of course, if you if you've had a chance to look at this uh, online yourselves, you, you already probably have a sense for this. Um, that one aspect is that the timeline is really too tall to show easily on a single screen. And show here, I'm showing you essentially a, a piece of it. Um, in this case, right, it's a piece showing the um, product categories for cleaning products and for food packaging. Um, and as you can hopefully see, uh, you know, below each product category are listed the projects that fall within that category. And then, of course, below the project titles or headings are the individual activities and milestones represented um, in the Gantt. Um, the colors, I would just say, have no inherent meaning. They're really there to provide some visual distinction, um, at least for viewers who can perceive them. Um, uh, so it's, you know, th there's, yeah, as I said, there's no inherent meaning in the colors other than to help distinguish one product category from another. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I've already indicated, the, the timeline shows a total of 15 months uh, or five calendar quarters. So that generally is the most recent past quarter, the current quarter, and the next three quarters. So at the moment, that means that the timeline displays October 2020 through December 2021. Next slide. So here's just another partial view, in this case, obviously showing uh, the beauty, personal care, and hygiene product category, uh, just to give you a chance to focus on that 15-month window. Um, so let's go on. Next slide, please. Okay, so lastly, uh, you know, I just want to note, as I've already indicated, that um, the timeline is not intended to present a comprehensive view of our work, uh, meaning essentially that it does not show everything that staff spends time on. Next slide. And to expand briefly on that last point, um, I'm actually going to take this slightly out of order and address the third bullet first. Third bullet first, right? So th the timeline basically just does not include uh, some types or categories of work that staff spends time on. Uh, it, that might include some really early phase scoping research, um, you know, pr administration program or project administration, uh, time spent collaborating with other agencies and states, uh, you know, the mandatory and technical training that staff take as a matter of course, uh, and deliberative processes, whether internal or external. Um, so jumping back up to the first two bullets here, uh, you know, I would say, if, as I think about it, the timeline really presents information from the perspective of the SCP program, right, from the, the work that the staff do. Um, you know, it, it represents or reflects the implementation of our work plan, and, and it really emphasize, emphasizes our activities um, and the work that we are doing, not necessarily the work that uh, members of the regulated community or regulated entities are doing. And I'll say a little more about that on the next slide. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks. Um, again, another snapshot in this case showing you the building products, product category. Um, and so I, you know, I've circled a couple of uh, activities here in red. Um, and essentially the point I want to make here is that work that the regulated entities do are generally implied by milestones or due dates. Um, so just to call your attention to the, the first um, example here, the revised abridged AA report due, right? That uh, 
we're basically showing a due date, which implies, of course, that the REs are doing work uh, to meet that deadline or that due date. Uh, but we don't show an activity bar immediately preceding it, uh, you know, labeled something like REs revise abridged AA reports, right? So it, generally speaking, the work, the activity is sort of focused on the work we are doing and deadlines or milestones uh, imply work on the, on the part of the REs. Next slide. Okay, so how did we get here, right? Like in terms of the process of the development of the timeline itself, um, Chris Lee and Eddie and I started working on this uh, last summer, uh, summer of 2020, I almost said 1920, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so we, we really assembled, uh, you know, the sort of preliminary draft of the content uh, last summer and then did, and particularly Chris did a, a lot of work to standardize the language used to describe product, uh, project, activities, and milestones. Um, and I think I would say there that the, you know, the, the real point was that we were trying to balance the consistency and the specificity of those activity descriptions. Um, you know, I think from the outset, the plan was to deploy the timeline essentially in conjunction with publication of our draft work plan. Uh, as you know, that was delayed to some degree. Uh, and so during a lot of the fall, we spent time uh, continuing to refine and revise the timeline. Um, and we, um, we finally were able to launch it or publish it uh, at the end of February of this year. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, we certainly plan to update the, the content and the timeline on a quarterly basis. Um, we are particularly interested in soliciting and evaluating stakeholder feedback, starting with, with you and this meeting. Um, and, you know, certainly as we receive feedback and suggestions from, from stakeholders, we, you know, plan to implement enhancements or make enhancements to the timeline uh, as a part of those quarterly updates, you know, to the extent that we are able. Um, you know, I think I would say that Right, like the timeline, we recognize the timeline is not perfect. Uh, it's a work in progress, and we are committed to you know to continual improvement as we as we move forward. Next slide. So I'll, I'll just close by describing a few of the challenges we've identified thus far. Um, uh, you know, certainly there are likely to be some new ones that that crop up uh, as we go. But in terms of things we've we've already recognized are, are challenges for us. Um, you know, as I said, this balance of consistency and specificity is, is one of those. Um, you know, as I think you hopefully all appreciate, the activities that, that the Safer Consumer Product Program undertakes uh, follow patterns established by regulation and experience, but are not identical from one project to the next. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of variability and trying to, trying, to be, trying to be true to that and reflect that accurately while still being consistent and providing language that is understandable to people outside the program is important to us. Um, representing activities greater than 15 months in duration is, is a bit of a challenge for us. Um, you know, and, and in fact, really that means activities that perhaps start before the 15 month window or end after. Um, you know, I've, I've just basically put a small graphic in here to suggest that if, if I could, I would choose to put a, um, an arrowhead on you know, on the beginning or the end of these activity bars to sort of provide some sort of visual cue to the viewer that the work started before or ends after the, the timeline window. Um, in, in the platform we're currently using Smartsheet uh, to generate this Gantt, that's not possible, unfortunately. Um, another challenge that certainly is, is foremost in my mind is, the, is maintaining the timeline with minimal staff effort so that you know, keeping this thing uh, current doesn't become a, a significant project or, or uh, time sink in and of itself. Um, and one possibility that we're exploring there is, is linking the content and the timeline to some internal project tracking uh, information in Smartsheet um, so that there's really more of a curation step involved, but, uh, you know, it, it kind of minimizes that work. Um, and then finally, for me, certainly, uh, you know, being able to create hyperlinks from the timeline itself to other uh, you know, resources on the SCP website, right? So somebody might be able to click a project heading and go to a page that talks more about that project. 
or that priority product um, would be wonderful, but is, is not currently possible. So it's something I, I hope to be able to do in the future. Uh, and that's, that's basically it. Next slide. So I just really want to say thank you. And of course, if you have any uh, sort of clarifying questions, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to answer them. Um, Topher, thank you very much. Um, I just want to add that Topher has been a longtime champion of green and sustainable chemistry. So it's just really great to see DTSC and uh, specifically the Safe Consumer Program, Products Program, being able to attract such talented and committed scientists. Welcome, Topher. Thank you very much. That means a lot, Art. Thank you. Yeah, at this time, are there any clarifying questions for Topher, Andre, Carl, and Chris based on the presentation or the supporting material? Um, just as a reminder, if your questions are questions more suited for the panel discussion, it would be better to wait until then. So I see a number of questions. Um, I have Mike. Um, Mike, your question? Yeah, if I hit the right unmute button there, sorry. Um, so for what was, and maybe this is better for discussion, just curious on the 15 month window that you chose, um, is that gonna be then a moving window? Um, you know, you set 15 months, so does, does it just keep moving forward or does the history stay back and it becomes a longer window? How are you gonna look at that? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I may defer to Carl on this. I mean, I, you know, honestly, this is something that uh, at the moment, my expectation is that the, the, the window would simply shift and that we would consistently show 15 months. Uh, but, yep. you know, on some level, I think, again, that's precisely one of the kinds of things that, uh, you know, one of the places in which feedback would, would be useful. I mean, I, I can understand that having more of that history might be of interest to, to people, so. Yeah, just let me add that, that yes, we plan on shifting it, but we also wanna capture history so that we can compare what our planned activities and the actual activities are for performance purposes. So as part of our overarching project management assessment, we haven't quite figured out how to do that yet. Um, I have Jack next. Jack? Yeah, along the same lines um, as Mike's question, do you time date stamp the uh, spreadsheet? In other words, every time a change is made, it becomes a, a new entity in effect. And then along the same lines, who actually can input the information? Is there one person? Is it Topher or is it somebody else? Or is there a group of people? Uh, and that way you can keep the information. You, know, you, you have much more control over the information to make sure it's accurate and precise. Yeah. Also, great, great questions, Jack. Um, I guess I would, you know, honestly, we, we are still kind of working out some of those processes. So I'm not sure I have a great answer for you. I mean, I, I've sort of considered certainly the former, right? Like this idea that we would do sort of discrete versions of every quarter so that we had a, a history, um, an archive, if you will. Um, but I, honestly, that's, I think, one of the, one of the, aspects of the process that we are are still are still kind of working out and uh and formalizing and just to add jack that as as topher said it's our hope that we will take the efforts we're doing to do uh use smartsheet as a project management tool at the team level individual level and to be able to just pull that data and roll it up so that it's less work and it's consistent and that, that also, I think, just to make sure that I touch on your second question, Jack, um, you know, whether or not we're using a tool like Smartsheet that is accessible to all the project managers in the program, for example, um, you know, obviously has a, a real influence on that question of who can touch the data. So again, that's, that's another important piece of this that we, we, have, to, we have to make some decisions on and, and formalize. Um, Meredith, is your comment related to Jack's question? Um, no, okay. In that case, uh, Melanie. Yeah, hi, this is not related to Jack's question, but I just wanted to, I meant to say this earlier, and uh, Carl pointed out a paper that was authored by the DTSC staff looking at their approach to regulating PFAST as a group. I just wanted to comment that I read that paper when it came out. It's a great paper very compelling arguments and it really moves 
a whole idea of regulating by class forward. So I just want to get that on the record. Excellent. Thank you, Melanie. And, and Blake? Uh, thanks, Art. And yes, very much echoing Melanie. I was going to say much the same in my later comments, and maybe I will just to have it on the record repeatedly. Um, I had a technical question, Topher. I wanted to echo Art's welcome. It's a pleasure to have you working for us in California after many years of working together. Um, I, I, just a technical question about, uh, I had the same thought when I looked at the timeline on online about uh, connecting it to other assets, because that seems sort of like an obvious way to do it. Is, is the limitation now a technical one? Just out of curiosity. Yes, fundamentally, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, technical one in terms of not having the software to make it possible or? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm happy to expand on that. Um, essentially, you know, as, as I've indicated, right, we, we are currently using Smartsheet as the platform and uh, we're taking advantage of Smartsheet's ability to publish, uh, you know, a, 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 in this case, a Gantt chart, right? It doesn't have to be Gantt, but um, uh, in order to do this in a way, I'm gonna try and keep this simple. In order to do this in a way that um, doesn't provide more control over the, the view of the data and the ability to manipulate the data than we would like for the public. Um, unfortunately, it, it also pushes us in a direction of a, a, a method of publication that just is, is essentially an, is not much more than a static image, right? So it, the ability to hyperlink within the, within the, uh, within the view is, is non-existent. So, um, you know, we are, um, we've only really just started, but we're exploring, you know, other platforms as, uh, as ways of generating uh, visualization. Tableau might be one of them, for example, uh, that may, may be more feature rich, but at the moment we are, um, we're, we're, you know, again, this is sort of more in the spirit of, we wanted to get something out provide the information, but recognize that there's room for improvement and we'll continue to, it'll continue to evolve as, as we move forward. Oh, good, that sounds good. Uh, I have Merit, we have next. Thanks, Art. Um, Telfer, could you say a little bit more about the, you, what you're defining as early scoping? Um, you mentioned that you're not including early scoping uh, information in the timeline, and I thought maybe it would be helpful to hear a little bit more about how you make that determination of, of that. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, Meredith. Uh, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Carl to sort of jump in and, and help me here if, if necessary. I, I mean, from my perspective, I would say that some of this has to do with the fact that some of that really early phase kind of investigative work that we do as staff people. Um, is not necessarily formalized to the degree that lends itself to representation as a project, for example. Um, I mean, I, I think the counter argument, of course, is that our work plan does obviously signal to the outside world that we are gonna be focusing on particular uh, product categories. And so there may be ways for us to go about doing that. And, and in fact, I think you will, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a good example to show you uh, in, in a screenshot, but. You know, there are some indications, uh, activities in the timeline that indicate some kind of, you know, research. So it's, it's not necessarily that that is never shown, but it's, it's partly a question of how to represent it, how to do it consistently. Um, yeah, I don't know. Carl, would you like to add anything to that? Well, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Andre, I think, because he leads our, our CPET team that, our chemical product evaluation team that does that work. But as you highlight these categories, there are many, many opportunities to look at various chemicals and various products in the combination. And we do a lot of work up front to narrow that pool. And so Andre, maybe, I don't know if you wanna highlight that. And he, Andre's talked to you about this before, that's sort of, you know, the early funnel um, graphic. Sure, yes, Carl. We, you know, a lot of times we'll be doing some preliminary work, some screening research that may lead to a proposal that we actually do a deeper dive uh, that might lead to public engagement. So there are th things that we, um, there are topics that we have done some level of sort of investigation, but aren't approved or, and there hasn't necessarily been a decision for us to go forward with them. So some of those, um, they're, they're shorter, often shorter term um, 
they just uh, we don't have typically a detailed project schedule built out, so it's just sort of premature to start putting things on, out on a public uh, timeline. Um, as Topher was kind of alluding to, we might be able to show some summary, like you know we're evaluating topics within the the realm of um, I don't know children's products during this window of time. But we we um, kind of wanted to kind of circle back to Mike's earlier question about the you know why 15 months uh you know the further out we go the harder it is to really predict there are a lot of things that can um unforeseen things that can happen that can change the course of a project or um there are things that we haven't decided yet and we don't even know how the project's going to go so we could put some um longer lines on the gantt chart but they may not be all that meaningful um just because of our iterative process um we just often don't know yet. Um, Andrew, I see your hand up. Did you also wanted to make an additional comment? Oh, well, I kind of threw in the one that I've been wanting to make, which was to address Mike's question about the 15 months. As far, and then there was the other one um, to Jack's uh, question about, um, you know, who would maintain the timeline. If, uh, I ideally, I would love it if our, um, individual project team leads would be updating the, the status and have that linked and automatically um, kind of populate the timeline. But even if we do that, there'll be a curation step or somebody like Topher will be kind of, you know, doing something to publish the timeline and um, make sure that there aren't any glitches or things that don't make sense. Uh, so hopefully we have some QA built in. Thank you. Kelly? Just a quick question. I, I noticed that the dates um, line across the top uh, doesn't roll down. And I'm just wondering, is that a technical issue with smart sheets? Yes, yes. again, uh, the, unfortunately, that's just one more aspect of the, what I was describing, yeah. Yeah, so. One annoying one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so. Let's see, um, I'm not seeing any more hands. Uh, let me just do a quick check. Are there any more questions Clarifying questions for Topher. Uh, Art, Art, can I just make one more point uh, before we get move on? Oh, is absolutely, that, please. Is that as Meredith and Andre alluded to, is that the staff, when, when we look at the work plan categories, uh, trust me, you know, a lot of these, our staff are very motivated and inquisitive and assertive, and they have all kinds of recommendations for things that we could pursue if we had the resources. Uh, and so we have to sort of winnow that down. And we do that both with public engagement and internally. But importantly, um, I, I want people to understand that there's, I think, 20 or 21 projects identified in that timeline. We don't have, you know, one staff or three staff dedicated to each. We have multiple staff working on multiple projects. So there's an element that isn't really captured here, which is the portfolio management challenge that we have internally. So that also factors into the, the length of time that it takes to get the work done. I just want to highlight that. Great, thank you, Carl. So at this point, uh, let's switch to the second presentation. SCP research scientist Rob Bushia will present the new 2021 to 2023 priority product work plan. He will discuss the new revision and updates to this work plan, as well as, as some of the reasoning behind these um, decisions. Rob? Good morning, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna go through an overview of the of the of uh, of our proposed 2021-23 priority product work plan. Um, my name is Rob Bruch, I'm a research scientist in DTSC's Safer Consumer Products Program. I think I know most of you um, and it's good to be back with you all, even if it is virtually, and hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to meet again in person if we so choose. Um, so can I have the next slide, please, Chris? Um, you can go ahead, there, that's, you can go ahead and put all of the information up on the slide, thank you. Okay, so um, just in the way of a quick review, I'm just gonna remind you of what um, our work plan does, its purpose. Uh, the primary purpose of the work plan is really to guide our product evaluation work and also to alert stakeholders. 
uh, it really frames our decision making for priority product selection. And we also hope, hope that it sends a uh, message to those stakeholders that we anticipate working with as we move forward implementing the plan. And it does these functions by describing the product categories that we will evaluate during the three year period covered by the plan and also provides a general explanation of why those product categories were chosen for inclusion in the work plan. Um, I just wanna point out real quickly that it does not identify any new priority products or create any new legal obligations for stakeholders. It is strictly a guidance document. Um, another function that uh, we, we hope the work plan provides is that we hope it sent, get, provides some general information to stakeholders about the specific work we plan to do over the three years covered uh, by the plan, but it doesn't lay out any detailed schedule or deadlines for doing that work. And that's really is because, you know, the product evaluation process is pretty complicated and it's differs for different uh, products. And it's, it's kind of impossible to know beforehand how, you know, what the outcome of the work will be. And so it's really hard to establish a, uh, a hard deadline. Um, as Topher noted in his presentation, we, we are working to develop that timeline, and we hope that that's going to better help, uh, help inform stakeholders at any moment in time what activities we're working on and then the, the, you know, our proposed timelines for completing those activities. And I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but I did real quickly want to mention one other new way that we have developed to uh, enhance transparency and share information with stakeholders. Um, you know, we do a lot of product evaluation during any period covered by the work plan. And for one reason or another, some products, we may decide not to propose listing them as priority products. And in the past, that typically has just been kind of a black box for stakeholders. We don't really announce our ultimate decisions in any formal way. And so what we've decided to do is we've started preparing decision documents that summarize all of the research we've done on a, on a given product and how we arrived at a decision to not list it as a priority product. And we are publishing those on our DTSC website, um, if you go to the Safer Consumer Products page, you click on Priority Products, there's a link on that page um, to other information. And you can access those uh, documents. And we will be um, publishing more as we do priority product work. And again, for one reason or another, a product that doesn't end up being designated or proposed listing as a priority product, there'll be information there for stakeholders. Um, can I get the next slide, please, Chris? Thank you. Um, so I just also want to want to briefly highlight the approach we take to developing a work plan. Um, you know, the selection of product categories to include in the work plan is actually pretty complicated. I mean, we're talking about a huge universe of consumer products, and the safer consumer product regulations really don't lay out any any you know process for identifying the product categories that we will put into any given work plan. Um, there's no formula or algorithm that we use for choosing product categories, and much of that decision making is left to our discretion, which we really try to exercise in a, in a responsible and transparent way. And to do that, we consider an awful lot of information. Um, and that includes recommended recommendations from our own staff. It includes a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, it includes input from you folks on the Green Ribbon Science Panel. And then we consider a whole variety of factors when we're looking at potential products, uh, product categories for inclusion such as, for example, the availability of information about a given product, uh, potential impacts of chemicals and products on sensitive subpopulations, um, environmental justice considerations, and so on. And as you're gonna see in a minute, a lot of uh, what is contained in our work plan is continued from a prior work plan, and that holds true every time we develop a work plan. And that's because the work we begin under one work plan often has to be carried over into a subsequent work plan because of the time involved. I mean, the research process itself is rigorous. It takes a lot of time. We actively engage stakeholders during that process. When we ultimately get to a decision to list, to propose listing a product as a priority product, we have to undergo an external scientific peer review process, which is specified in law. That takes several months. And then we ultimately have to um, initiate a formal rulemaking, which again, the steps of that are dictated by law, and that takes some time to do. So a three-year time frame is not always a reasonable time frame for us completing the work that we need to do to ultimately get to a, a, a new product listed in our, our priority products list. And as Carl and Meredith both noted, our program is relatively small. We have some limited resources, and that also weighs on the time frame. So again, 
our work plans, our subsequent work plans often provide a lot, lot of continuity with our previous work plans. Um, and as I mentioned here, we look to our, our colleagues at DTSC um, who do a tremendous amount of work evaluating products. And for this work plan that we're gonna talk about in a minute and for other past work plans, staff often make rec recommendations for product categories to include. But again, we have limited resources and so not all those recommendations can make it into the plan. And we do deliberate internally. And we often, again, considering a variety of factors, select one or more categories for inclusion and some don't make it in. Um, and again, a large, in large part, decisions are discretionary, but ultimately informed by stakeholder engagement. Um, and in, indeed, we, we work hard throughout our entire process trying to engage stakeholders. And that's the very purpose of today's meeting to start that process. And next week, I want to mention, we are holding a public workshop on the work plan. And we also have a public comment period that is currently open on our CalSAFER website um, for stakeholders to comment. And the draft has not been finalized. I want to point that out as well. It's important and input from you folks and from our stakeholders may result in us revising it before we publish a final. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out that we also actively seek input from other California state agencies, boards, departments, offices, as well as from other states and the US EPA. We have strong working relationships with colleagues at the US EPA and in the states of Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, and so on. And we rely a great deal on those relationships to help inform our decision making process. Okay, um, next slide, please, Chris. Um, one final thing before I get into the nuts and bolts of the work plan. Um, in our previous work plan, we had a set of policy priorities that served as the basis for designating or for choosing certain product categories to include in the work plan. And those policy priorities and considerations were taking, taken out of this work plan and they were replaced by something we call priorities and considerations for implementation. And really the reason we took them out is just because we don't need them. Uh, again, continuity with the past work plan, you're gonna see some of the same product categories. The reason that we originally included those categories in the work plan is explained in that in our previous work plan. Um, and so we took them out and um, let's see, we only have two new product categories as you're gonna see in a minute. But again, we replaced those policy priorities with a set of priorities and considerations for implementation that we're going to consider as we look at specific products within the categories and decide which ones we are going to, we, we may propose listing as priority products. And some of those things that we're giving special consideration to are listed right here. Okay, um, so Chris, next slide, please. All right, so now we'll get into the nuts and bolts of the work plan. These are the categories that we propose, including in, in the work plan. And the beauty, personal care, and hygiene products and cleaning products category, we intend to carry over without any real revision. They will be carried over just as they were in our previous work plan. We have a lot of ongoing work in these categories. If you read the draft um, work plan, it describes a little bit more detail that work. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, here. Um, we also propose carrying over the beauty, or I'm sorry, the, um, the building products and materials used in construction and renovation product category from our previous work plan. However, we do propose a slight revision of this category, the description of this category, that will in essence expand its scope somewhat. Um, what we propose to do is now include products or materials that are also used in outdoor settings such as in recreational fields, parks, playgrounds, and so on. And the reason that we proposed doing that was because of public comments that we received um, regarding our proposal to list carpets and rugs containing PFASs as a priority product. Many stakeholders in commenting about that proposal um, ask us to take a look at artificial turf. And so we intend to revise the product category description to allow us to do that, again, if resources are available. Um, we also propose carrying over our food packaging category, and, but again, we want to slightly revise the definition of that category. And the reason for doing so is because we found out while we were working on our last, on our previous work plan, that the definition that we used was a little bit unclear um, regarding certain products that may have multiple uses. For example, a paper plate may be used to serve food, 
in, in, a, in a takeout setting, but it also may be used to package food. And so what we propose to do is to um, change that definition slightly to clarify that pro all products that may be used to package food, including things like paper plates, could be captured under this definition. Um, and then finally, I mentioned that we intend to um, include two new categories. One is children's products and the other is motor vehicle tires. And the reason that we chose children's pro products is because this was a category that was recommended by staff. And we find it especially compelling, of course, because children are a sensitive subpopulation who may be especially susceptible to uh, potential adverse impacts uh, from, from chemicals in products. And we are aware that this category is potentially huge. And therefore what we've done is we've aligned the definition of this category with the definition of children's products um, that was developed by the state of Washington. And that really narrows the scope by limiting the products that we may capture. But I do think it important to note that inclusion of this category does not preclude us from looking at children's products that may fall within other categories. For example, within the beauty, personal care and hygiene products category. Okay, now regarding motor vehicle tires, um, we are adding this category because we received a petition specifically to add motor vehicle tires with zinc containing tread to our priority products list. And we found that petition compelling and we've decided to grant it. And therefore we still have work to do in this category. And so we will be worth working to further evaluate motor vehicle tires under the next work plan cycle. In addition, some of you may be aware that this last December, a re excuse me, a research group in Washington published a paper identifying an anti-ozone chemical known as 6-PPD that's added to tires as a, um, that chemical undergoes a reaction with ozone to form a 6-PPD quinone that they sh have shown is um, potentially responsible for acute mortality syndrome in coho salmon. And so we intend to take a look at that as well as other chemicals. Okay, can you uh, give me the next slide, please, Chris? Thank you. Um, so we, we are gonna drop some categories from the work plan um, and they're shown here. We have previously evaluated products in the household, school and workplace furnishings as well and, and decor category, as well as the uh, consumable office school and business supply categories. And we do not have at this time anticipate having additional resources available to start evaluating new products in these categories. Um, our draft work plan discusses in a little bit more detail why are, we are considering removing them. Um, so I don't wanna go too heavily into it, but another reason that we do have for removing them is we, that, that I do wanna point out is that we've decided that in general, we don't want to put categories in the work plan if we don't have the intention to actually work on products in those categories. We don't wanna send a message to stakeholders that, um, that implies that we will be working on those categories if we don't have any intention to do so. So, and then finally, um, we intend to drop lead acid batteries from our work plan. Uh, in the wake of concerns some years ago regarding the lead acid contamination in the community surrounding the Exide uh, battery recycling facility here in California, we were asked by Governor Brown at the time and the legislature to evaluate <clears throat> lead acid batteries as a potential priority product um, under our pre that was under our previous work plan. And we conducted extensive research on potential exposures and ad adverse impacts from lead during the life cycle of batteries, as well as the scope of existing regulation um, of lead acid batteries throughout, throughout their uh, life cycle. And we concluded that um, listing them as a priority product is not likely to enhance protection to human health, given that billions of dollars are already being invested worldwide in researching new and safer technologies for batteries. So we are actually in interested in stakeholder input on this issue. And in fact, we do plan to hold a workshop on lead acid batteries in the near future. Um, really, that concludes my presentation. Um, and so you can put up the next slide, Chris. And I'd be happy to answer any clarifying questions you may have at this time. Rob, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, excellent, really informative. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask if the uh, panelists have any clarifying questions for Rob. 
Andre and Carl based on the presentation and on the supporting documents uh, materials. And again, as a reminder, if your question, if your questions are questions more suited for the panel discussion, it would be better to wait until then. So let's see if we have any um, clarifying questions. Uh, Be Rebecca, Becky? Hey, yeah, I just had a couple questions. Uh, but first, thanks for pointing out where the decision documents and technical reports are gonna be for priority products. Well, things that don't end up being priority products because I had looked around for that last night and couldn't spot it. So now I know. Um, two questions. The first is on the cleaning products. In reading the work plan, you mentioned the potential for the COVID situation to result in increased exposure. And I just wanted a little more clarity on the scope because I'm assuming that a lot of the antibacterial products would not be within scope, probably the active ingredients and the inert ingredients. Um, and so I just wanted clarity there. Uh, you are correct in so far as anything that is regulated as a um, under under the FDA's pesticide regulations, antifungals, antimicrobials that might be that might fall under that purview wouldn't are actually excluded from regulation by us. All right. So it would only be things that are not already regulated by the FDA in that context as a pesticide type of an application. Okay, great. Just wanted to clarify that. And then this is another sort of technical question um, that may be, uh, the answer may be revealed when you post your decision document, but you mentioned thermal receipts and bisphenol A in the work plan. And I was curious whether bisphenol S was also part of your review process or whether you focus more exclusively on bisphenol A. I'm gonna allow Andre to answer that because I was not involved in that project. And so I don't really know to the extent which they considered things like bisphenol S. We had uh, done some screening research on bisphenol S as well. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit drawing a blank, but I, I, there, I believe the information we had at the time um, that we decided not to pursue the thermal papers was that um, there were other alternatives already being implemented. I, I'm going to check on it and maybe uh, later on I can, because um, I know I have it in my notes, but um, uh, we did, uh, the short answer is we did look at this from OS as well. Okay, but our I'm deeper sure. dive was on A. I'm sure it'll be public soon. So I was just curious. Yeah. Well, let me just also add that just to note that, you know, there's a temporal element here because when we look at something you know, we're choosing not to pursue it right now. That doesn't necessarily close the door if something changes, if we get more information that suggests that there is an issue that we weren't aware of. It's just, we're trying to be transparent about how we're spending our time. And we think it's important to share that the work that the staff do uh, publicly, because we do a fair amount of work, um, you know, that I think it can consolidate information for folks as well. Um, I, I would like to add one thing as I, I think as it's highlighted in the draft work plan, as I recall, um, the US EPA did come out with an alternatives analysis regarding the use of bisphenol A in, in uh, thermal receipts. And that really is the crux of our program. I mean, ultimately that's the, the end game. The ultimate goal is to have manufacturers do that. And so I think there was some discussion that since that's already been done in essence by the US EPA, that compelling manufacturers to redo that work wasn't necessarily something that would be the most productive uh, use of our resources to do. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions to inform our discussion. Uh, the first one, and they're really different, sorry. Uh, so the first one is around the petition process, uh, since one of the discussion questions is about the limitations of the work plan. And the case study of the 6PVD quinone and its acute toxicity of fish just happening to show up at exactly the right time to put it into the work plan uh, reminds me that um, compelling scientific discoveries on harm from chemicals and products can occur at any time and be a complete surprise as they were to both the industry and everyone else in the world on, on this one. Um, so I, I, I um, understand that the petition process is DTSC's only mechanism for um, updating, you know, adding something to the work plan between work plan updates. And I also saw that it took, I think, three years at least two years for the department to get to a decision on the tires petition um, on zinc. And so I'm just wondering what you learned from that process and 
um, how that might compare to um, a work plan update or some other kind of process that would require a regulatory change. I think I'll let Carl and or Andre address that one. I don't really know how to address it. I'll jump in and then Carl may want to uh, add to what my comments. Um, the, the, the kind of the premise behind the petition process is that the petitioner essentially does the work that we would have done. Um, so there were a couple of reasons why it took two years, but it wasn't two years of working time. Um, one was that we, we uh, after evaluating the petition initially, determined that we needed some more information to really make a uh, merits determination on that petition. So we asked the petitioner to um, provide some additional information, which they did. So um, there was then, um, we had to evaluate that. And then there's just sort of the, the briefing and, um, and decision-making process. In this case, it's a fairly high stakes uh, decision to pursue this petition. So we wanted to make sure we crossed all our T's. So, um, you know, we're, um, I could say in, as a general statement that um, the rate at which we are able to um, start from a screening research to finalizing profile is significantly reduced from where it was uh, when we started the program. And I wouldn't probably use the evaluation of the zinc and tires petition as sort of the um, metric for how long that takes. But um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Jack? Uh, the, um, I think Carl had something to say about this. Oh, I'm sorry. And then I've got another quick question on it. Okay, sure. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I was just going to add that, you know, that um, keep in mind that the work plan is a general menu and and the petition process is a specific um, decision that's much further down typically in the process so um, the timing for tires i think was good um, we also got a lot of input from the industry themselves indicating they thought it would be appropriate to put six ppd in the work plan um, so that wasn't um, good to see but so i think um, yeah there is some uncertainty when we start the work plan process and things take time so you know, something could come up um, that would be challenging for us to deal because it's not in the work plan. Um, but that's that's part of the reason we have are asking people for input. So to see if there is a category that, you know, there is emerging information that might suggest that it makes sense to put it in there. Um, but we'll always have a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, one other thing real fast that I'd just like to point out is that the petition process is not the only venue that we have for adding things to the work plan during the period of the work plan. I mean, if the legislature or the governor's office direct us to do so, that's another mechanism for, for it. Thank you. Um, and then quickly, the other question was um, that you mentioned the um, Tosca preemption as being an issue. And I, I just was hoping that staff might be able to expound on that just a little bit to inform uh -huh. our discussion. Well, well, um, that's a very broad and deep issue um, and complex, but I think in a nutshell, uh, we are monitoring the, the EPA priority chemicals uh, that are identified um, and their process. You know, in a recent ECOS uh, workshop, uh, EPA essentially said their process is a six and a half to seven year process by taking something from listing as a priority chemical through an action under section six. Um, so we monitor that and um, there is on some obviously uncertainty about what EPA will ultimately will do or not do that might preempt us. So that's part of the equation about, you know, how, how important and valuable is our work going to be to move things forward if EPA is um, working on that as well. Certainly we're hopeful that, um, you know, I think Meredith that we've got an early good reception from Meredith's outreach to EPA that we'll be able to do things like re-initiate uh, our MOU with EPA on green chemistry so that we can have discussions about what they're doing, their priorities, and how they might align with the states uh, so that we can maybe occupy space that they're not, so that we don't have to worry about preemption if, uh, or if it's in a space that we know what that carve out might be, an area that, that might be difficult for them to, to pursue. So there's a strategic element there that's really important. Um, and, um, you know, they've got now um, a lot on their plate. Uh, and, and there's also a, a, some uncertainty about what they're going to do with the new administration and looking at some of the decisions that were made in the last uh, go round, which we feel are important because some of the mm, uh, risk evaluation and scope of work processes were uh, 
interesting from our perspective, I guess. But so I'll leave it at that. But yeah, it's safe to say that we're very aware that we can't afford to, to spend a lot of resources on something that hopefully EPA will do a good job of doing. But we also are want to make sure that we can um, work with them and hold them accountable as well. So I don't know if Meredith wants to add anything. But. I, I don't know if any of our EPA colleagues would like to add anything, but I, I'm guessing that will come out later. Um, so at this point, I have Jack and Melanie. Um, so, and then we'll switch over to um, the dis camera discussions. Uh, Melanie? I'm, I'm sorry, Jack. Uh, just a couple of quick, you've been talking about EPA, but EPA is not the only federal regulatory agency around. Um, I'm looking at your children's uh, products, toys, car seats, jewelry are all actually regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, the chemicals may be EPA, but the products themselves are CPSC. Do you have any contacts with those people? Um, they're a little bit different in how they approach safety. Um, and I've got a second question, sort of also on the same line of the children's products. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you've got cosmetics used by children listed twice now, one under children's products and one under health and beauty products. Um, is that double jeopardy or are you actually going to have one group doing, doing it with two intentions, <laughs> sort of, so to speak? So thanks, Jack. I can answer those pretty quickly, I think. Uh, yes, uh, CPSC has um, their perspective, their authority, and their uh, reach, if you will. As does, I would point out, FDA is a similar issue. Um, and uh, FDA, we've worked with uh, and coordinated with, um, and we've looked extensively at their process and what is and is not covered, particularly for uh, food contact materials and food packaging. Uh, and, and similar to CPSC, we, but we haven't engaged with them as much. I think it's the, the general uh, approach we have is that all of these um, uh, authorities, regulations, and programs have strengths and weaknesses and authorities and gaps in authority. And so we, we cannot go counter to any existing federal or state law uh, for the same endpoints that we're concerned with, but there are plenty of areas that we feel that there are gaps and that's where we would focus. And we would obviously uh, work with FDA, CPSC, any other state and federal agency as well uh, to ensure that one, we're efficient and, and legal, but also to learn. I mean, that's one of the big things that we staff spend time doing is learning about these processes because it's always new to us when we, we're in a new category. So, um, but it's a really good point. And your second point on, um, um, remind me, Jack, what your second? Uh, the fact that you've got cosmetics oh. used by children in two categories now. Which right. Is so the categories, as, as Rob pointed out, is that um, they're not mutually exclusive or they're, they, so a children's product might be in one category or another. We're going to be transparent about why we're looking at it. That's the main thing. Um, if something's outside any of the categories, then we won't be looking at it, but it might be in multiple categories. Similarly with some of the considerations, when we look at sensitive subpopulations, they're in many categories. So it's just another one of the criteria, if you will. Thank you. Melanie? Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to comment that it's, it's interesting to me that you're looking at tires as a whole, and then you're also proposing to look at artificial turf, because the little black beads that come home in all those soccer playing kids' shoes are recycled tires. And there are data that show that uh, when it rains, the rainwater that comes off these turf fields has a lot of zinc in it. So I think it's a good, like, it's a good meshing of um, ideas to look at them both. Uh, and I, I'm sure you're aware that OEA has a program that's look, been looking for quite a while now at the chemicals in artificial turf and exposures of athletes to those chemicals in conjunction with Cal Recycle. You can tell I like that idea. Yeah, we are in fact aware of your program. And in fact, I believe that the folks that are that have been working on tires. I recently joined that effort with the six PPD, but I was not involved with the zinc aspect of it that's been ongoing for some time. And I believe they've actually been in contact with the OEHA's folks on that, as well as the artificial turf um, question. Although I don't 
think that artificial turf has active, actively become a new project of its own yet. Um, as I pointed out, we intend to look at it if resources become available um, to allow us to do so. Okay, um, I have Elaine then Jeff, I'm with Andre. Elaine? It, so I don't know, it seems like maybe we're moving into comments, but um, I just did wanna follow up on EPA. And um, so uh, like Jack said, um, EPSC does children's products, but um, and uh, cosmetics and personal care products is so food packaging. Carl mentioned is is not EPA, that's FDA, but also um, cosmetics and personal care products are not under uh, Tosca. That's also um, with FDA. Um, thanks, Ray. Um, Andre. Andre, um, I'll give you the last word. Um, I, Sorry, I lost my mouse. Sorry, All right. I was trying oh, to find okay. the unmute. Uh, I just wanted to chime in to um, kind of follow on Carl's response to Jack's comment about um, other agencies um, regulating products within our categories. That you know, we we have in our framework um, some language that says that we can uh, regulate a product chemical combination only if we determine the listing would meaningfully enhance protection of public health and the environment. So if somebody else regulates it, we look at it critically and decide whether or not we can meaningfully sort of enhance protection. Um, given the limitations of our resources, we, we, we don't um, have any interest in sort of trying to duplicate effort, even if we, even if we could. That, that was all I wanted to chime in. And that's probably more than a clarifying question, actually. Andre, that was fine. Um, I just want to do a time check. I noticed that it's 10.37 and we were scheduled to have a break at 10.40. So let me ask my co-chair, Kelly, if we should actually um, go ahead with the break. And then when we come back, you can uh, chair both the preliminary comments and the more of the deep dive, dive discussions. It's, um, I think the, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we have time to do both separately. Right, I, that's totally fine. So what I'll ask panelists to do is we're gonna have a lightning round. If you have anything to poke in about these things when we come back from the break, really wanna go quickly. So I'll just go boom, 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 boom. Anyone who has anything to say. And then if you wanna raise something for discussion, we aren't gonna be able to discuss everything but um, please do that. And then we'll try to pick a few for discussion. Maybe we'll even use hand raising to vote. So I uh, see you in exactly 10 minutes. So it's now 1038. So 1048, we will get started with that lightning round and uh, feel free to turn off your camera in the break. Thanks. All right, panelists, this is the lightning round. And I what We'll do, if you have something quick to weigh in on, um, this is not a requirement for everyone, um, but if you do, and I think most of you probably might have something to say, um, please, um, now would be the time to do it and we'll look for hand raising to do that. Um, and also, if you'd like to suggest a topic for discussion, I'll be keeping a list. So I'll start the lightning round uh, with uh, some very quick comments to hopefully be a role model. I wanna compliment the staff on the transparency provided by the, the timeline. Um, the update date on it would be super useful. I've seen OPP's um, timeline. It's very helpful to know how in or out of date it is. Um, and I found missing here um, information about the longer scale of the program. So something that some sort of timeline that isn't specific to a product, but walks people through all the steps and the general timeframes that it takes so they can understand what happens once a listing occurs, for example. Um, in regards to the priority, priority product work plan, um, I am concerned that the existing process makes it difficult to respond to a new scientific finding that would be um, a compelling reason for the state to address a chemical product combination. Um, so I'm not, I just want to raise that and in response to your request about advice from the um, panel on that. Um, in terms of potential additional categories, uh, ones that leap out are cigarette butts um, due to the cellulose acetate fibers. 
Um, and for future work planning, not this work plan, I think there are gonna be ripe categories associated with urban runoff. So the tire fish story is just one story of many that I think are gonna unfold over the, under the next few years. And also I'm considering taking a look at pollutants that are either passed through or create um, challenges for disposal of the treatment products from potable reuse of wastewater effluents, which we're looking at in the next decade. So that's my lightning round, and I see hands up starting with Ann Blake. Joys of being early in the alphabet. Um, thank you, Kelly, and thank you everyone for the presentations and the staff for your continuing excellent work. Um, I wanted to also echo Kelly's comments about uh, your efforts at transparency. I very much applaud those, and thank you for taking our, uh, our comments uh, so much to heart and, and taking action on them. Um, also echoing what Melanie said earlier, congratulations on the publication and the very creative use of a video. Um, I was very surprised to see the back of my head in that video, but you know, we, we take what we can. Um, my <laughs> two seconds of fame. Uh, keep it up. I think this is a great start. Um, and you are taking your rightful public place as thought leaders and practitioners in this safer alternative space. So I'm very, very proud and pleased to see that. So thank you for doing that. Um, most of my comments are towards the, uh, focused on the, uh, priority product work plan, the uh, draft work plan. Uh, I wanted to say first the priorities and considerations. I thought those were excellent additions and articulations of that. So thank you for that adjustment um, and Rob for the clarification of what they were replacing. Um, I, th I think that's excellent in terms of uh, both external transparency and I suspect also internal clarity for your decision-making um, and guidelines for having those moving forward. So that's an excellent, uh, uh, excellent addition to have had uh, or rewriting in, in the work plan. I appreciate your continued uh, focus on worker exposures and your very timely focus on changes to exposures during the pandemic with cleaning, cleaning products. Um, and I particularly support your rationale for continuing beauty and personal care and cleaning products uh, because and highlighting your uh, poten potential focus on hair straighteners uh, and nail products, uh, which have specific impact, disproportionate impacts to women, women workers and women of color. So very a very strong uh, support of that. I also wanted to strongly support your new focus on products that degrade to microplastics and food packaging and the intersection of those. And I can uh, talk more about those, the intersections of climate and the expanded petro uh, petrochemical build out. Uh, to increase plastics production capacity, but I think it's important to think about that context. So I appreciate uh, that particular nexus. And I think that's it uh, for me for now. Thanks, Anne, for being lightning. I've got Elaine, Helen, Jack. So shoot. Okay, um, thank you. And so just up front, um, I, I do wanna um, just say to the staff that, um, you're doing an amazing job, and, and I keep hearing I keep hearing you beating yourselves up about how long things take. <laughs> so, um, just you know, I think you should should appreciate more that um, that you are leading and you are making a big difference. Um, on the, I'm going to focus really on the um, work plan, and um, also. Um, share that I, I like the priority considerations a lot. In fact, I, I feel like they should be brought up front. Um, and I feel like um, the, the, the microplastics one should actually be generalized a bit to water quality and aquatic impacts, because I think that, um, uh, you know, cross cuts a lot of your um, priority uh, products or product categories. Um, so it, I think it would be nice to have that generalized a little bit more. And then if you wanted to give some detail about why those are your priority considerations, you could um, mention the uh, microplastics. Um, product, uh, the, so under product categories, um, to, um, really then, then you could really say how they align very specifically with those considerations. But I, I get confused when we have product categories and then we have these other mandates that are also called product categories when they're really products. And so it would be, I think it would be helpful to everyone or just clear, uh, provide clarity if you had the product categories and then you had the other mandates. Um, and then it, it would just seem more uh, consistent. I, I guess the one cross cut comment with the um, work plan I heard um, you mentioned that the screening and research that you do kind of sort of pre 
timeline um, is not reflected in the timeline. And I don't think that's necessary, but it would be nice to have it reflected in the work plan where you maybe talk about that the screening research is, is focused on the categories um, and what that strategy and process is for screening maybe a little bit. Uh, but I also think, um, and yeah, what, you know, what kinds of things are you screening um, if those are appropriate to signal. But I'm, I'm also wondering about understudied. Um, there's been a heavy emphasis everywhere uh, on formulations and things where there's, a, there's more information. And um, I see you pulling things off like um, moving away from some of the building materials and articles and textiles and stuff. And I know you can't do everything, but maybe that is something you're still doing screening and research on. So if you could maybe mention that or capture it, or, or I'd like to tee that up for further discussion. Um, and those are my lightning comments. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, continuing with the lightning round, Helen, Jack, Becky up next. Okay, hey, great. Uh, mine, mine are very short. Um, I wanted to give the feedback that uh, I do also like the timeline and do think that just having the updated date is helpful on that as well. Um, and just want to thank you for um, including the um, uh, trans uh, doing the transparency for things you are not taking forward. Um, thank you for hearing us on that. It's very, very helpful to have that insight of the full view of what you are doing as well as what you aren't doing. So um, that was it. And also um, just congratulations on the article. I think just keep doing that. That's a, a very good direction and well done. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Jack, Becky, Molly are queued up. Okay, quickly uh, read through the priority or the draft priority work plan. Uh, and again, Something I've asked for previously, when you get to motor vehicle tires, for example, uh, it's all about zinc and its bad effects, but I think it would be much more beneficial to the readers to actually put a few sentences in as to why zinc is there in the first place. Uh, zinc is a hugely important part of a tire um, and it does have a role to play. It's not just there for, for fun. Um, and I think if you, if you actually make that statement to say this is an important an integral part of tires currently, then I think people at least understand why it's there and what some of the issues are going to be. So if down the road, for example, if you decide you can't do anything, at least you've sort of set the stage saying there's nothing else that can do the same job as zinc. Uh, I don't believe that's going to be true, but I think if you look at not, if you put something into each of these to say, this is why this material is currently there, uh, I think you'd actually give a much more well-rounded approach to the, to the issue in general. Um, for example, you also talk about um, what, six PPD. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> uh, I assume it's there for a reason, but I don't know what the chemical even is. I'd have to look it up. So I, again, just a little bit more well-rounded uh, uh, presentation of what the chemical is, why it's in that particular product, I think would be useful. Um, I've also looked up some of the abstracts for the reports you talked about for hair straighteners and hair dyes. Uh, hair straighteners are basically sodium hydroxide. Uh, it's, it's almost literally one chemical. Um, but then you get into, well, what if people really want their hair straightened? Um, are you gonna hire an ethicist to say, uh, we're not gonna give it to you? Because sodium hydroxide is pretty ubiquitous in reality, it's just alkali. Uh, but you should also then include maybe hair perms, which are basically the same technology, just a milder scale. Um, so I think you've, you know, you're opening up Pandora's box if you get into things that people want, even though the, the chemicals themselves may not be the nicest. I mean, alcohol, you know, lye is not a nice chemical, but it's what people use to straighten their hair. Uh, comment on that. Um, the, I think they may, the, the terminology is more generally used as hair relaxers. And um, that's where the Brazilian blowout and formaldehyde releasing chemicals came in. So it's a whole nother class, um, which um, it actually got a lot of uh, um, regulatory scrutiny in Calif uh, uh, originating in California. Yeah. No, I know that's a separate class and we're not, I'm not talking about formaldehyde. I'm talking about hair relaxers, hair straighteners. They're the same, it's lye, it's sodium hydroxide. Uh, hair relaxers, Brazilian blood is, is, um, 
is uh, the the active uh, intermediate is formaldehyde and it's a, it's a hair relaxer. Yeah. So I don't think we're going to solve this right here. So uh, okay, I, I think I, the staff are going to get the idea. So Jack, uh, thanks for opening Pandora's box. Uh, is that is that your lightning round? Uh, that's it. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that some of these get a. You know, I just want uh, the team in their presentation to show that they've looked at it in a much rather than just always seemingly say let's get rid of it, which I know you don't do. I think you need to show that you're aware of what its benefits are. Yeah, and it, in some cases, it may be a reduction rather than elimination. I think that isn't always clear either. So moving on in the lightning round, I've got Becky, Molly, Julie showing up next. Hey, I, I thought the timeline was great, so I don't really have too many comments there. For the work plan, I definitely like the priorities and considerations element to help guide uh, interpretation of the categories. And I have a similar comment to Elaine of expanding the more environmental or wild, wildlife oriented uh, consideration. I think it's great and important to specifically include microplastics, but it felt also a little narrow. And also uh, the, the microplastics element wasn't kind of drawn through the rest of the work plan. There weren't specific connections made to the different categories. So you might want to just add in a little bit there about how each of these categories may possibly release microplastics if that's the case, if that's going to be an element of the review. Uh, then uh, one comment on the building materials and construction uh, materials category. I'm, I'm a bit sad to see it go, although I see that you've done a lot of work. Uh, for me, again, on my whole wildlife perspective, I see the, the human health work has been excellent, especially the worker exposures. And then I'm left with, what about that urban runoff that Kelly mentioned? Uh, you know, all this outdoor activity as we make all our buildings can lead to wildlife exposures. And so uh, for me, uh, while the theme of resource constraints was pretty strong in the work plan, and I really respect how you have to pick your, um, your topics and be careful of your workflow and your staff um, feeling overextended. Uh, perhaps uh, building construction materials from a wildlife or outdoor exposure perspective for the environment could come up in a, in a future work plan. That's it. Thanks, Becky. And just as a reminder, Jack, if you're done, please take your hand down. Um, Molly, Julie, and Melanie are in the queue for the lightning round. Mm -hmm. Molly, you're up. Thank you. Um, so awesome job as always, and um, a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, oh, I guess just two comments on the timeline. One is to please do keep looking for other technologies that will allow for the hyperlinks. I think that will be very helpful um, to give more context where is needed because all, obviously all those descriptions are really short and concise. And for people who don't follow the program regularly, like a bit more information will always be useful. Um, and I guess on that same point, I guess I'm I'm concerned, given all the um, all the conversation that, um, at the beginning about the resource constraints and and um, the staffing needs and how incredibly over um, over uh, um, overworked, if you will, um, uh, the staff are and the workload needed and that's just it's not conveyed in the timeline and what I'm thinking of just making sure that this um, that the program remains protected about the um, when there is the ask for additional resources and needs that um, that somehow somewhere it's ref like something referenced more in full about the scope of the work that's responsible to do this is 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 a reference somewhere so that people just don't look at the time and like this is all you're doing um, which is not the case, but I, again, just to ensure there's protection of the program going forward and the extent of, of work necessary, um, that somebody just doesn't look at the timeline and the work elements there and think that that's it. So, and I, and you were very explicit to say there is so much more. So somehow providing people that, that, that avenue to see the so much more, I think might be useful. Um, on the priority product work plan, I think it's great. 
um, applaud you for, for including the children's product as its own category. I think this is, I like the alignment with Washington and Oregon. And I also just wanna say it's also consistent with what's happening in the European Union, um, you know, under its chemical strategy for sustainability, they've completely, you know, called out children's products and articles as being a key element of that strategy in terms of, of chemicals management going forward. So it's also very consistent with what's going on in Europe. Um, I did have one addition to um, the, uh, uh, um, the priority considerations for implementation. Um, I thought that the criteria that were outlined were great. What seemed to me to be missing, which is what's really um, compelling about personal care products and cleaning products, is, is some element about, um, about potential for repeated exposures. The fact that people are using these, these things every day, every day every day. Um, the exposure potential itself is high, but also repeated. Um, and I think that's also true with the, um, um, the environmental related scenarios as well, as well, in terms of all of these being, you know, ultimately washed down the drain repeatedly over and over and over again. So some, something that captures that element of the exposure potential, um, which I think is why it's so defensive to focus on cosmetics and per personal care products, why it's so defensive to focus on, on cleaning products, I think might be helpful. There. Thanks, Molly. That repeated thing is certainly a huge, huge issue in the water community as well. Uh, Julie, um, Mel Melanie, and then Suzanne are in the lightning round queue. And since we're not hearing a lot of discussion topics, I would encourage staff to consider whether there's some things you'd like to ask us to discuss. Well, hello, everyone. It's good to see all of you. And I want to thank the staff for just continuing to do an amazing job with limited resources. Uh, very important work. I'm very excited to see the journal paper. So I hadn't seen it until all the agenda items came out. So I'm eager to read it closer and very proud of that and strongly encourage you to continue to have that on your to-do list to find opportunities for such publications. Um, I agree with what many people have said. I like uh, having the priorities, uh, the considerations for implementation included in the document. I think that that does give some guiding principles. So I'll, I'm supportive of that. I just wanna raise uh, the lead acid batteries and um, I'm not sure I should say I'm sad to see them get off the list. I'm happy to hear that there's billions of dollars being invested elsewhere, but maybe some clarification on what else is happening where and what directions you do see. I'd be interested in knowing more. And um, the community is, again, I'm sure there's a whole series of research that's gone into making that determination. And I, I think, um, Clarifying that would be uh, of value because it's clearly, clearly is a product of concern uh, with a chemical of concern with some issues in the state. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. I, that um, certainly I'd echo that, making sure there's a clear, clear, solid message on the batteries. So we've got Suzanne and Melanie in the lightning round. Hi, it's Melanie. So I, I just wanted to say I really I liked the timeline. And I, I had a thought while you were talking about how to convey the uncertainty in some of the, the work that you're doing. You know, it's like I have it fading out at the edge or towards the future. So just let people know we, we, we really don't know when we can finish this because of all the different things that come up that you have to consider. So that's one idea. And I, you know, I thought it providing people with uh, the overlapping nature of the project was good, but the, it's there's so much uncertainty because of short staffing, all these other issues, that that's really kind of a key thing that you need to convey in that timeline. So, and then in, ter in terms of just a couple of thoughts on the uh, product work plan, somebody already said, I agree, I'm glad that you put children's products in as a as a target because it, this is a key sensitive subpopulation and the, for those of you who know something about developmental neurotoxicity, for example, they can be profoundly more affected, children can be profoundly more affected than the same exposure in adults. So I, I think that's a, a great um, addition. I um, wondered though, if once you remove a category, 
like how do you get it back in and is there a way to signal that you aren't really done with these categories you're just not working on them for this three-year work plan i mean maybe you do say that but um because I, again i thought of the furnishings in the decor and the consumer office supplies there might be something that pops up and you go oh boy we need to look at that and is it going to be too hard once you've de-emphasize those categories. So that's kind of more of a question for discussion. Thanks. Suzanne, you're up. Sounds good. Um, I echo the comments of everyone else. Greatly appreciate the overview of the timeline and description of the work plan moving forward and getting us all on the same page. And thank you so much for all of your work on that, even given um, you know the shortage of resources resources that you described. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, I did really appreciate the perspective in the article recently published on PFAS and considering that as a larger class of contaminants rather than trying to think about each individual um, chemical since there are so many. But I also had a thought kind of similar to what others had expressed about microplastics. I think this was comments expressed um, by Elaine and Rebecca on thinking about microplastics a bit more broadly across all of the categories you're considering. Like others said, each category can release microplastics, even tires, for example, we're focusing on some of the leachates, but of course there's a whole other Pandora's box if you think about um, tire wear particles and effects on the environment and maybe applying some of the um, perspectives on PFAS to microplastics is also being, you know, this class of contaminants we need to think about a bit more broadly. But, but thank you so much and um, really appreciated um, the overview on the new work plan. Thank you very much, Suzanne. I, I'm hearing a lot of comments kind of on themes around the staffing situation and clarifying that and lamenting it and uh, the microplastics and the, the non-human environment being important roles. So I certainly concur with those. Um, and one thing I neglected to mention as I look for anyone else who wants to make a lightning round comment or suggest a topic for discussion is that I think a really key audience of, or two sets of key audiences for the work plan are scientists um, because DTSE does lack uh, resources to do everything they'd like to do. Um, I've got a lot of experience running a program that was um, very limited in its funding and uh, by going out and giving pre presentations at scientific conferences was able to um, excite people about doing research that uh, really helped us out for free. Um, and similarly, other government agency partners, and I, I think you've probably been thinking about and talking with both of those groups, but just to be more explicit that those are key audiences for the work plan might be helpful. So I see um, Emma and then Elaine coming back for more lightning round or topics for discussion. So Emma, you're up, then Thank Elaine, you, then Kelly. Art. Thank you. Um, I think the conversation on tires and what further exploration or understanding there might reveal is, is interesting and, and well said, but I commend you on being able to focus in one area because that's how you can get things done. Um, the one thing that jumped out to me in the work plan that I want to commend you on is um, the, uh, the identification and emphasis on sort of unexpected or unintended exposures. For example, the children coming into the nail salon with their parents, those potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations are important to remember and consider. Chemicals are often... Uh, people or receptors are often exposed to chemicals that they were never intended to be exposed in the first place. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Emma, excellent points. I, El Elaine, then Art. Yeah, I mean, I just, as I guess it's a category for discussion, this issue around the um, priority considerations on water quality and aquatic impacts and stuff. I, I think Kelly, you might've um, hit on this, but this, uh, you know, California in particular, but really nationally um, and globally with this intersection between, you know, water and climate and um, having the, the access to that resource that, you know, is safe for both, you know, humans and um, eco um, ecology just seems to be something that could uh, you know, this, this group is already working so hard on in, in uh, some of the things that you're doing that it would be nice to highlight that or discuss it further. 
All right. Well, let's let's circle back um, and see if there's interest in following up on that. I'd like to let Arden up for lightning round or what he'd like to suggest for discussion. Um, yeah, I think I wanted to expand on what you were saying about the target audience. So um, definitely, you know, when it comes to you know, scientists and other regulatory agencies, in addition to manufacturers and the general public, those are really important. But I think the one that's missing and the one that's you know really uh, important for uh, companies is uh, the uh, suppliers or um, contract manufacturers or applicators, the users. Uh, I, because you know they are the ones who will, will have one of the largest potential for exposure. So you know when you're thinking about making products using the materials that are in question, you know in the priority product work plan, it's the workers, you know, making stuff, the potent, using the uh, priority products to make, you know, uh, um, consumer products that will potentially have the highest exposure. So I think that's another group that's missing that we, uh, we need to target. Thank you, Art. At, so at this point, I would like to ask if anybody else has any um, remarks with regard to um, the target audience, because we were just barely touching on that. So go ahead, Melanie. Yeah, I, I had the same thought as you that we're, it's kind of missing the people who are, could do the research that would help the program. So, you know, it, and it, I think it would take a special effort, not just posting the work plan to actually, you know, reach out to those guys. And there's a number of universities now with green chemistry programs, that's one you know, find out who the key contacts are there. And you probably already know half of them anyway. Um, I, so I think it's really, really crucial to do that because that will stimulate research. Other folks who want to leap in on, on uh, target audiences? Okay, hearing none, I'm, I wanted to circle back to um, Elaine's comments on uh, the water quality aquatic impacts. And I, she raised the kind of the climate change linkage. And I just wanted to see if anybody had any thoughts about that as to how DTSC approaches these, you know, are there things that, that people should be thinking about at the department, either for this work plan or for future work plans around those areas? So I go ahead, I think Emma, Ann, then Melanie, if you, yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm, I'm a newer <laughs> member of the panel, so not quite as well versed maybe in the full um, program. Uh, there are a number of life cycle considerations that are considered at the alternatives analysis stage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're talking about a work plan right now, but if these were to get to alternatives analysis, does that address, um, not address, but does that include some climate considerations like global warming potential of a chemical that might be an alternative, for example? It, does staff, is anybody from staff answer that question? And, I, and if you could remark at all about what, whether and how climate change is, is considered in the work plan, that would be helpful too. So yeah, I can respond. Actually, Andre and I were just talking about this yesterday. Um, the um, the work plan specifically doesn't address climate change in, it, in its priorities, but our our process considers uh, greenhouse gas impacts and things and a variety of factors in the AA process. Um, I think part of the question is really for us is how can we at the front end. Uh, understand when a certain product chemical combination might uh, be something to focus on because there's nexus with impacts on climate. Uh, so, for example, uh, water, you know, as the climate impacts water resources, obviously that uh, might raise our concerns. But I think there's other issues fundamentally about uh, chemicals behave differently in diff at different temperatures and in, in, in more aqueous environments. Uh, and certainly sensitive subpopulations that are impacted by climate might be more vulnerable to certain types of chemical exposures. 
those are things we don't have a lot of information on that would be helpful for us to figure out how to get it and find out where that nexus is. But we do, the AA process does consider that when we, when we ask people to look at impacts and it's, it can be a relevant factor. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Yeah, so I'm seeing Emma nodding. Uh, so as I pass it off to Anne, I just wanna know part of why I mentioned the um, potable reuse of wastewater effluent is that water is a resource that's going to be stressed and so we're having to look at different systems and I'm not sure, I'm in fact quite sure that's not the only place where we'll be stressing a resource and changing what we do that has real implications uh, for chemicals and products. Uh, so that's something it would be helpful if panelists could signal to the staff. So I've got Ann, Melanie and Elaine. Um, thank you and thank you for I'm delighted that this conversation has come up because I think it's long overdue in our conversations around chemicals and where we get them. Um, I know I've been talking uh, with DTSC staff uh, elsewhere about broadening the context. I don't know how this works for the program. I think this may be beyond the program scope, um, but at the very least you could set the context of saying, you know, that, that uh, chemicals and materials are this blind spot in the climate conversation. Uh, chemicals, all many of our chemicals, particularly agricultural chemicals, obviously outside the scope of this department, but you know, within the scope of colleagues at Cal EPA and elsewhere. Uh, but things like plastics that you're already looking on, those come from petrochemical feedstocks and those are going to be the main driver for oil growth, uh, the growth in the oil uh, in the coming decade. And so if California is gonna be serious about taking on uh, climate, taking climate action and climate mitigation, I very much appreciate the, you know, thinking about how we adapt as our, you know, as we, has our environment has already changed in, in as a result of climate. Uh, but what can we do next? How can we build a different kind of materials economy uh, and think about alternatives even more broadly? Where where could they come from other than bio uh, other than petrochemicals? Um, and California as a as a huge agricultural uh, state and economy is the world's sixth largest economy and a huge producer of commodity agriculture. We have a huge opportunity in biomaterials as well, but we need to be very cautious about not repeating the same errors with biosourced materials as we do with petrochemicals. So that's the context. Um, I don't know how, you know, specific things that, that uh, SCP can do, but I know there's a lot that Cal EPA obviously can do and that uh, maybe DTSC can as well, but I'm, thank you for, for the opportunity to bring that nexus here. Thank you for raising that. So Melanie, Elaine, yeah, I just wanted to point out that the hazard trait regulation does have as one of the hazard traits greenhouse gas. So what the potential for um, the chemical to to contribute to global warming. So that that it's clearly on the plate for the DTSC's program. Uh, and also California is very, very worried about drought and the effects of climate change increasing the severity of droughts in drought years, and the water board um, is, is actually concerned about microplastics now and looking to see is there a way to figure out how, what's, what's a safe exposure to microplastics. So it, it's really, a, it's, I think it's a good nexus there too, and I'm, I'm sure DTSC has been talking with those guys. If you haven't, you probably should. Thanks, Melanie. Yet another interagency connection here. Uh, Elaine, you're up. Yeah, so I, you know, just to, um, I, I do think this is an important discussion. And just to clarify, I, you know, what I'm um, hoping that, you know, staff will be thinking about in context of the work plan is really this additional context. And, um, and in terms of the priority considerations, uh, really connecting to water and, and connecting then this, you know, critical uh, impacts on the water supply associated with climate. So not necessarily having to broaden your scope so much as, as you know, just better articulate those priorities and really show throughout how, ma how many of the things that you're focused on are water quality issues, that have these more general impacts and why this is continues to and is becoming even more critical, you know, so I think it helps you just even explain your priorities in a, in a way that maybe is, is, first of all, regionally particularly compelling right now at this moment, <laughs> but then, um, 
you know, so when you're trying to decide whether you're doing something versus somebody else is doing something, it, you know, you could really make a, a very compelling case for, for why this is so important for California. So as I shift over to Abby, um, who I am seeing wants to weigh in here, and that would be interesting. I just want to point out that I think that one of the themes of this conversation is the idea that we're changing materials flows um, and environmental flows as a result of climate change. So another example is that we're seeking to not generate waste and send it to the landfill, but rather you know, have that life cycle where we're reusing things. And uh, one of your product categories, uh, the perfluorinated chemicals in foodware could directly relate to that since a lot, some of that material is compostable and then that affects the whole cycle. So I don't know if Carl or Abby wants to go first, but I will let you um, leap in on this. Well, Abigail can talk, but I just wanted to make up a, a general point that I think is important and that I, that I really appreciate this discussion because you know, we often as scientists and engineers, we like to put out plans for things that we know exactly how to do it. You know, We wanna know, yeah, we're gonna do it and this is how we're gonna do it. And I think you've touched on a point of this considerations, part of the, the the power of the work plan from our perspective is putting out questions that we don't have the answers to, that we are asking uh, all the stakeholders to chime in about their perspective and give us information that will help us learn about how to focus and prioritize and do better. So we're just sharing with you sort of our inherent thing. We wanna get it right. And sometimes just putting out this, as Elaine so eloquently said, the context of this is really important. And I think that can be very powerful. That's very helpful, so thank you. Thank you, Carl. Abigail, you're up. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. Um, I I think this actually ties into the context piece. It's just an idea that maybe we can consider, but that um, tying into climate, we do have a mandate to consider the subpopulations, and we know that climate justice um, is. Uh, an important thing we should be considering as well. And so I wonder if from the front end, that might be an app that are. Darn, Abigail's cutting in and out, but I think basically that what you were trying to get us to comment on is uh, climate justice and how that might play into the selection of products. Is that right? Oh, darn. Um, so why, Andre, why don't you go ahead and we'll see if we can clarify that further. Sure. Uh, yeah, Carl and I were talking yesterday with regard to the climate impact, you know, whether um, chemicals with um, greenhouse gas chemicals or whatever. Um, um, Melanie was correct that that is one of the environmental hazard traits in the regulations that we could cite. Um, but the chemical would need to be on one of our 23 authoritative lists. So Currently, we don't have a list of chemicals among the, the, the lists that make up the candidate chemicals list specifically for, for chemicals that um, contribute to climate change or greenhouse gas. So that was just kind of just throwing that out there. Carl and I were talking about that yesterday. So do panelists have thoughts about these topics? I, I'm thinking about you know the climate change chemicals list, the um, basically the climate justice and some of these environmental justice issues, uh, you know, how department might be able to uh, incorporate those. Uh, are, are there any tools or other ideas that you have about how the department might be able to identify products to put in its work plan that would really make a meaningful difference? Elaine, you're up. So I actually just, um want to point to where the staff has already already done a really great job when they did the 1,4-dioxane um, plotting of the, you know, where the, where the um, uh, more at risk communities were or the, you know, um, lower income and plotted that against, you know, environmental levels or drinking water levels and stuff. I think that kind of context and framing is so useful. Um, and, and you know whether or not it specifically speaks exactly to the you know there was an issue about whether that connected specifically to the product use or to the legacy contamination. Um, to me, wasn't the most important thing. What was really 
important and compelling was that we have people who are very impacted and then moving back to think about the sources and the um, exposures and stuff from there. But, uh, but so I think actually you're already doing that nicely. And, um, you know, I would just encourage you to do that, you know, more with, with more of the things that you're looking at, because that was, that's so powerful, those visual um, analyses. So Anne? I wanted to echo and expand on that. Thank you, Elaine. I agree. I think that uh, using the environmental justice lens, and I think as I said at the last meeting, using that as the first lens um, when you start looking at exposures is key. Uh, and But it's just, we keep talking about context. Context is absolutely key here also. We must keep in mind, um, particularly, I mean, we are talking about California, that the, the communities that are most impacted uh, by toxic exposures are also the ones that are most vulnerable to climate impacts first. So I don't know how that plays out into DTSC's work, um, but definitely as you're talking to your allies and colleagues in elsewhere in state government, um, that's something that that's a message that you can keep alive and keep highlighted that we need to take care of. And we have the opportunity to take care of both of those issues in a systemic way. There. Thank you. Um, that is, I, I, I think what, what we're getting in the silence among the panel here is, yeah, an honor of the staff and a recognition of the challenge of, of tackling this. But I'm, I'm also hearing that it's really important. Is that, it, does anybody else want to weigh in on this particular topic? Okay, so seeing none, um, I want to turn to staff and see if there are any, you gave us a big long set of charge questions, uh, many of which were addressed in panelists' comments. And because we had our screens on, I know that you saw the um, nodding heads on, on many of the, the comments. So I think there was a lot of agreement all, all, among a lot of the lightning round comments. But um, um, so those of you panelists, if you wanna have a quick look at the questions at, in the panelist chat, the staff have posted the charge questions for us. So I was going to start with staff and see if there's any of those questions you'd particularly like us to tackle or a different question that has come to your mind as a result of the discussion. So Kelly Grant has her hand up, please. Uh, Kelly and Topher, please go ahead. Kelly first. You're on mute. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to ask the question. Um, as we were talking about the timeline, one of the things that I think became um, obvious to me is, you know, the first thing we show is the 1,4-dioxane in cleaning products. And that has, um, in, in the immediate term, that has been preempted by EPA's uh, action under TSCA. Now, there are lawsuits going on, but how would we, we reflect something like that in the timeline when, you know, there's really outside forces that have potentially shut down a project? Um, how would we reflect that in a way that's meaningful and that shows that, you know, we didn't just drop this because we were too busy or, you know, whatever. There were outside forces that, that caused that. So I'll look for a panelist's reaction to that and then we'll move on to Topher's question. So Elaine, you're up. Then Ken. I'm, I'm wondering if you can't, um, because I do think that's kind of an important thing to be able to reflect in the timeline. I'm wondering if you can't write on that bar with the, the title of the product chemical, um, if you can't just put a little star and, and note what's, what the pause is, you know? Because that is, that is I think, one of the most, um, I know you've put a lot of caveats around everything, but that really is 100%, you know, something that you're um, outside, outside your sphere of influence. <laughs> All right, Ken, Mike, Molly, thoughts? Ken, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Um, great, great dialogue. Great to hear from everyone today. Um, one of the things, Kelly, you might think about is the fact that um, with TOSCA implementation, um, 
that process is slow, deliberate, um, not as quickly as maybe how the states can move. So I, I think we're just going to have to acknowledge that as we go forward. And a number of our states are working with our state's attorney generals really as as a, a voice for, for the states. We don't have quite the bandwidth within our own agencies to uh, monitor this from sort of the legal standpoint, but, you know, there are a group of states that are working together um, to, to monitor all the implementation going forward, as well as other associations and, and, and interests by local governments as well. Thanks, Ken. Mike, Molly, Melanie. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to to think of this way, Kelly, um, of what with the product you have right now, you know, because certainly, as you look at what Topher was saying and how he'd like to make it more interactive and and create links, the the links would be the ideal way to to go into this, um, you know, put a link into the topic and say, yeah, this is on pause because blah blah blah. But you can't do that with what you have now. I I would say that the best way to make sure it stays transparent is to um, just add another line item, you know, right under the, the activity that you're putting on pause, you know, put, you know, uh, task of preemption, you know, happening or task of preemption being monitored and give that a long thing. Once that's done or you decide it's too short, you can leave that line item, but then go back up and restart your timeline. It, I think that'd be something that, that could well be done with the product you're currently using. And it gives that, that transparent information. Um, and it lets them know that you're still doing something because even if another agency is looking at it, it doesn't mean you've given up or you're just waiting. It means that you're gonna sit there and monitor it, perhaps interact and throw comments in as, as even a public commenter but you're still very involved. And, and people should know that too, is that you're not just looking at your program as a standalone, but you're looking at that towards other agencies and contributing to their activities. Yeah, it's really important for our state. I think the last couple remarks are really important about our state, you know, everyone else to recognize that our state is actually working with other places. So um, Molly, then Melanie. Yeah, I think I'm just affirming what Mike said. Um, I, I think there's, you can, perhaps there's a way to fake it in these scant chart programs where just add another row, but don't fill in the calendar and call it a note. Um, and it might, I know there's a, there's, there's a desire to keep all of the timeline elements kind of more standardized and consistent. And I bet you probably have some sort of qualifying statement about most of these. Um, and so it could just be another consistent element that you add, um, you know, to the timeline that adds for some of these, you know, notes and comments or something that reflects some, some important statement about why something hasn't moved forward or why you're holding on something or otherwise and just have it be a comment row on every element of the, of this, of the timeline and just don't fill in the timeline elements for it. Yeah, so another argument for the links that Topher wants to figure out how to put in, <laughs> the Melanie and Julie. Yeah, I was just going to I like these ideas. They're good. I, I was thinking like a news flash kind of um, newsletter, you know, make sure that each project has a little link so that you can, just, you know, put stuff in there that's current and what's happening and why is this going slower or hey, we're actually going faster, you know, whatever. Thanks, Julie. Um, just in listening to everyone's comments, I'm thinking that maybe this is also it's suggesting that the products that are being taken out of the work plan, like the lead acid batteries and the building supplies and school supplies, that people have some concern about why are they being taken out, making it clear why they're being taken off the list or the active list, that they're not completely gone, right, that they still have their own work timeline also that you're still monitoring what's happening with those product chemical combinations, even if again, there's very limited um, milestones or task items. Thanks, Julie. So I think I'm gonna take this over to Topher has been waiting with another question for us. Let's see if we can get through that. And Melanie, if you could put your hand down, please. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, again, just wanna make sure you can hear me. Yes. Okay, um, so actually, if, if I may, I, I just want, want to make one 
one or two really quick comments on this last topic. One thing to note, uh, and I wouldn't expect people to have noticed this necessarily, but if you look at the timeline uh, specifically for the project for spray polyurethane foams with MDI, you'll notice that there uh, is a, a task or a task bar that says further activity on hold and refers viewers to uh, the notice of compliance, which uh, given the limitations of the platform was sort of our best way <laughs> kind of work around to like at least tell people where to look to, to for, for some more information about that. Um, and, and actually on the topic of SPF, I kind of want to maybe make one comment referencing the climate conversation, right? Which is that uh, for those of you who are at all familiar with the legal hurdles we've encountered recently with respect to MDI and SPF, uh, I think we recognize that this is one other place where climate is intersecting with the work we're trying to do. So I really just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and so then my question, you know, I, let's see, I mean, we, we've been addressing this. I think in, in a sense, my question is, right, the conversation we've had earlier about, especially with, with respect to trying to find ways to, uh, to, include some of that early scoping type work in the timeline. You know, for me, the fundamental question is if I, when I'm thinking about the conversation from the November 2019 meeting, right, about the value of signaling, you know, perhaps particularly to industry, but to stakeholders in general, what we are doing, you know, to me, the question becomes, you know, it's right, we, we want, we want the, ratio, the signal to noise ratio to be appropriate, right? So I think for me, the question is how do we, how do we signal some of that early scoping work we're doing without, right, without generating so much noise that the that industry groups, for example, can't really discern what is of concern, right? I think, you know, I, I recall that in that meeting, Helen made some comments about, right, like you can only pay, you can only pay attention to clear signals. And, and so, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, this question is not very well uh, explicated, but hopefully you, you get you get a sense for what I'm asking here. Yeah, so basically, how can you, we, the department provides some transparency with regards to that early work without providing so much detail that it's just confusing. Exactly, thank you. All right, so good. So Elaine, you're up and see if anyone else wants to weigh in on this one. Yeah, I think I, um, for me, I don't think that does belong in the timeline. And I, I was thinking um, that maybe in the work plan, you can just add a little section talking about the, the scope of what you screen and research, right? So is that is that all in the um, product categories that you have mentioned in your work plan? Or do you also do some scoping and screening on some less studied uh, categories? And what might those be? But I'm not sure that I, I agree with you. I'm not sure it's appropriate to, um, you know, like Helen said, if it's not a clear signal, if it's just a, you know, you're just exploring. Um, I don't, I don't know that's helpful. But I think it would be nice to sort of put out what is your strategy and approach for for focusing that that screening. One one issue with this um, before I go to Tim is um, they, there are times where um, having conversations, particularly at the scientist level, could stimulate the generation of information that would be helpful to the department. Um, and the way to, sig to signal that may be to go to audiences that could share that information rather than to just put something on the web. But you don't want to be accused of going to a conference and talking about something and not making it transparent in any other way. So that's, that's a difficult question. So I've got Tim and Mike. Uh, thank you. I, Topher, I thought that was a very well phrased question. Um, it really got me thinking. And um, Kelly, you framed the question as, you know, trying to figure out how to send clear signals or not to send murky, uh, kind of murky signals. It got me thinking about uh, also giving a lot of thought to like when you want to signal. So sometimes it's a problem that there's too much uh, communication that creates noise or you're not articulating it well. And that's one issue which I think we've talked about. 
The other is like, you know, um, you know, sometimes enough transparency is enough, right? That sometimes if you're engaging in truly exploratory work, uh, it may be that you don't want to signal that, that the value of sending those signals out may be uh, outweighed by the confusion that it may create. I mean, assuming it's a clear signal, hey, we're looking at this, that could be a very clear signal. But do you really want to signal that if it's truly exploratory, if, you know, signals are meant to change behavior, or maybe sometimes it's too early to try and convince folks to change behavior, if you're truly kind of just getting a sense about whether this is worth looking at and those sorts of things. So I don't have a sense of like, uh, you know, just how, uh, uh, conscious the signaling behavior within the agency is like how how often you think okay we're engaging in some work we think it would be good to move away from this chemical or get people to be thinking about let's send a signal or whether sometimes you're like hey should we be worried about this and you're doing some exploratory stuff and if that's what's going on I think you'd want to think twice about whether you want to signal that. Certainly people are entitled to find out information about what their government agencies are doing along the normal course of things, but that's different than saying, trying to put, you know, send up a flare that you're doing something, because sometimes I think that may be unnecessarily confusing or disruptive. Thanks, Tim. I really appreciate your bringing up the other angle on this question. So Mike, you're up. And if those who have already spoken could take down their hand, it really helps me chairing the meeting. I'm really reliant on that function. Yep, and I'm going to lower my hand now while I've got my hand on my mouse. Um, yeah, and I, I think I kind of want to echo a lot of what, what Tim was saying. I think, you know, as, as you make these exploratory items more public, uh, sort of like when you were looking at the lead in uh, fishing tackle weights um, and the immense amount of interest you suddenly got there, might, maybe more than you wanted, um, that if you make it too public and if you throw it in the timeline, it's going to be a lot of clutter. You might not get people seeing it, um, but you might still want that information. So maybe what you want to do is instead of adding it in through a timeline and, and in the interest of transparency is have a totally different mechanism, even if it's a list of things that we are starting to think about that you've actually talked about internally first, because I agree with Tim, you don't want to put it out there before you're sure you want a response, but it might be good to have a, a list out there of if you've got information for the agency, we're starting to think about this, you know, any any comments are welcome. It could be a simple, a separate list off to the side and and, and very easy like that. Um, but but don't let yourselves with the limited resources you have, if, if you open up that you've reopened Pandora's box and people are going to start giving you more information that, that you can actually handle. Thanks, Mike. That's a good point. Andre, um, and then we'll circle back to Topher if he's still got something he wants to say. Right. Uh, we typically have been trying to, before we're fully baked, but at some point before just starting our initial screening research, engage with the public and through um, putting out maybe a background document, maybe four or five pages with some questions, and we'll have typically have a workshop, but maybe there's a way to sort of front load that a little bit or maybe even earlier, but not too early, sort of in when it's strategic to do that. So Topher, did you want to follow up on any of this? Um, no, not really. Thank you. I just that, that was that was helpful input and I appreciate it. Thanks, Kelly. No, oh, thanks for raising the question. Uh, these staff questions are really helpful for us because we, we want to be as useful as possible for the staff team. So Jack, you've got your hand up. Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> Not a good at all. Um, yeah, I agree with what Mike has just said that um, there are a number of activities which have already taken place. You've done some scoping. That's really not for a timetable. You don't, I mean, timetable to me is all about what you're going to be doing. Um, so I think a lot of this, you don't, you don't want to capture that way. But if you are going to do, um, uh, as I think Andre just said, if you're going to have a public meeting on something, that to me is the type of thing you could put into a timetable because it may not have happened already. It's more of a public discussion. You could say we're going to have a workshop, we're going to have training on this particular chemical or product category. That to me is 
would be acceptable in a timetable under scoping or if it's not a project as such. But I think if you're just going to say this is what we've been doing, that's not really uh, information you want in a timetable. Uh, but if it's a definite public event or you're going to have a meeting or a training exercise with some group, I think that's totally appropriate to put into a uh, timetable looking ahead. Thanks, Jack. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in on this? So we just have a couple minutes. So I wanted to offer first the panelists and the staff opportunity to say anything or raise any last last bit. So I'd say Helen's been remarkably quiet today. So <laughs> but Meredith is here. Thank you, Meredith. I'll just add one thing. A couple of times in the in the conversation over the last half hour, there have been mention of kind of things being on the back burner a little bit. Like if we're still keeping an eye on things. And for instance, when we wrap up our work on lead acid batteries, will we we keep watching that? And I just kind of want to manage expectations a little bit because um, I don't envision, and Carl could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't envision that being very active. You know, that's the kind of thing where you could, you know, you could spend a lot of time just continuing to look at the stuff that you've looked at, but at some point, unless, you know, information actively comes to us that's going to trigger an action, we may not be always scanning the landscape on topics that we've already researched. So I just wanted to raise that because I thought I was hearing a couple people suggest that that was how we're doing things. And I don't think that's actually the way it's gonna work moving forward. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you for clarifying that because I did hear some expectations that didn't sound like they were within the bandwidth of the staff, either current or even future with expectations expansion that at least I personally hope is able to occur. So do staff have any last burning questions for us or other other things any, that anyone wants to raise? Uh, we're in the, the last few minutes. Here, Rob, you're up. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to say also that, um, you know, I heard a lot of feedback from a few folks saying, how much they appreciated our decision document um, efforts where we're gonna now describe in the decision documents, um, you know, when we make a decision not to list a priority product, what that's based on. And maybe that's a place also to think about um, doing some of the kinds of things like Meredith was just saying, well, maybe we won't follow that because unless something comes to light, maybe that decision document page is a place to post information like that as well that we're not gonna follow up on these things unless new information comes to light and that stakeholders are responsible, or I mean, are um, not responsible, stakeholders are welcome to at any you know, time to contact us about such things if new things come to light. But maybe, maybe that's a place where we can not only say why we're not choosing to list a particular priority product, but maybe it's a place where we can also interact in terms of things that we're dropping like batteries and things and saying you know a little bit more about what we intend to do in the future if anything um just an idea that lots of nodding heads here so elaine quickly and then i'll give ann cooper a moment and then we'll have to wrap up yeah well i would i would just follow up on meredith's comment by saying that there are that there's a good reason for regulators to say they've done something and they're done you know and and people can take their actions and their work that they're doing more seriously if they know that there will be an end point. You know, I think that's super important. And, you know, certainly we've seen in the last however many years that, that people want that. They want certain things to be sunset and they want you to move on to more compelling work. So. Anyway. Thanks, Elaine. That's a very supportive and important point. And Cooper, you're up. Just really quickly, just hearing this talk about you know, talking to academics and um, signaling kind of the initial work that we're doing, it makes me think about setting some sort of research agenda for the program um, that could be publicized in some way. And I know ARB does that, and that would definitely be a bit of an undertaking, but just kind of thinking in my head about ways that we can help convey the research we're doing initially in that initial phase when we're still really open to more input and also our ongoing questions that we've got. Yeah, and I think the panel recommended that to the department in the past. So I'm glad that you raised that that, that 
prior panel recommendation as something to really, you know, we've been talking about leveraging scientific expertise yeah. outside the department and so forth to support you. And there seems to be a lot of energy and willingness to do that. So thank you for raising that. All right, so uh, we are at the point of wrap up. Um, and I first, I'd like to turn this over to Meredith and Carl, um, and then Carl and I, or Art and I will wrap up. I'm gonna let Carl give the closing comments. I'll just say thank you. It was really wonderful to participate with everybody today. And again, I really appreciate the wisdom of this panel. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, I, I wanna echo um, Meredith and, and the staff's thanks to all of you for your engagement and support. It's, it's really helpful for, for us to get your feedback. Uh, and we've got a lot to think about today. Um, I think I also want to acknowledge our incredible staff. Um, thanks to Chris and Kelly for doing the logistics and coordinating this with Art and Kelly. And thank you, Art and Kelly, for your leadership as well. Um, but um, our staff are the ones that do all the work. You know, we just, we're just trying to, to, to figure out where to go next and how to do it as best we can. Um, and we're really blessed to have them. So thank you. Um, but um, also looking ahead, um, there's things to, to follow from this meeting. There's other things on the horizon. We're gonna be moving into regulatory response mode soon. Uh, we have some issues we might wanna to talk to you about on that. I think the other thing that struck, struck me about today was that um, a lot of the things that aren't in the, in the timeline, a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the things that you all are doing in terms of you know, uh, exposure science, emerging contaminants, uh, tools, new methodologies, systematic review, et cetera. And we've, we've worked like with Elaine and others and many of you on some of these issues. We may wanna talk about how we capture that work and maybe to this research agenda, what are the key things we need to do to improve, strengthen, uh, and look to the future for the program because those are concrete things. It's not just bodies, but it's skills and it's um, how we can collaborate. We do a lot of collaboration with our, our colleagues like Ken in Washington and the other states, IC2, A4, uh, Molly's shown a lot of leadership on that. I mean, there's lots that we do. We could probably benefit from your wisdom on how to do that better and how to focus on that. So I'll just leave it at that. And, and then again, with my thanks um, and uh, hopes that everyone stays safe and we're looking to sometime down the road being together in person. Well, like perhaps that. that's a topic for a forthcoming meeting. So um, at this point, we don't know. Um, do we know when the next meeting is on your horizon? Carl, do you guys have any? We, we haven't on? set the next meeting date yet. Um, we're looking, we're trying to, with the virtual um, mode, we think we can be a little more nimble and meet for a shorter amount of times more frequently. So I think, you know, certainly this summer, we'd like to have a, a meeting um, and um, we know people are busy. So. We'll, we'll work with all of you about finding some timeframes and then just as importantly, what subjects we wanna talk about. Well, I, I think a research agenda would be something that I think a lot of folks would probably be interested in advising on if, if you're prepared to think about that, but you guys have to figure out what, what kind of advice is going to work best in the flow of work that your, your team has with your available re resources. So um, for panelists, uh, one thing I wanna say before we close off is that we're still, Art and I um, and the staff team are still trying to figure out how to make a virtual meeting work well and whether that will be part of the long-term uh, platform for this group will depend partly on whether we can make it work well and also partly on uh, whether um, any relaxation is available under the state public meeting slot that we operate on um, Bagley Keene. Because if that um, is re-pulled back to the way it was before, it, we did find that previously it was fairly difficult to hold these kinds of meetings under that law. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but for since the next meeting is almost certainly going to be in this format, if you have feedback uh, for Art and me um, or the staff about running these meetings, ideas about how we can do better, uh, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And you could send that either to Chris Leonetti, who's the one who um, sent out the packet. So he's our, he's rotating in as our new, new liaison or to Art and me directly, or I'm sure if you sent it to any of the staff that they would forward it along, but that would be most helpful to us in figuring out how to proceed with the next meeting. 
Um, and then I want to move and just say um, thank you very much. I, despite the difficulties of the format, I was very impressed at the panels and staff's ability to um, hold a meaningful discussion and provide um, what I'm hoping was some helpful input to the staff. Um, and I appreciate your time and patience uh, with all of the things that we've had to go through here and your obvious detailed attention to the packet and the background information you know, based on the quality and level of the comments that were received. So thank you very much. And I do also especially wanna thank the staff team. I, they were just amazing to work with as we worked through all the logistics of this meeting. And I just can't believe how smoothly it came up despite the many logistical issues that we work for as well as their um, preparation on content. I, I don't know about you, but I continue to be highly impressed at the types of charge questions that we're getting in the briefing materials are very appropriate for a high level scientific group. It's been really neat to get that from the staff. So Art, do you wanna say a few words and close us out? Um, yeah, just another big shout out to the staff. One of the uh, benefits of being a co-chair and one of the privileges of being a co-chair is getting to work very closely with the staff in terms of you know, organizing the meeting and also seeing what they do behind the scenes which is really, really impressive. So um, I thought the meeting went really well and I look forward to seeing everyone again soon. And with that, um, should I adjourn the meeting? You yes. should. Okay.